Good evening. Good evening. It's 7 o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to call the meeting to order. Good evening. Tonight is Monday, September 13th. Then we do have a quorum, so I will call this meeting to order. The first order of business tonight is agenda approval. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. second. I was going to ask if we, um, we could move the, um, to make a change in the agenda. Um, we have an existing um, motion to approve the agenda, so we'll have to vote on approving the agenda first. Um, or do we want to, can you tell us what the change you want to make is? Yeah, I was just going to move the assessment plan from discussion, from information to discussion. From information to discussion. So are you guys appro okay approving the agenda with the alteration of um, the assessment plan being to, as a discussion as opposed, as opposed to an information item? I would just ask the question if if administration is ready to prepare to discuss it and not have as just an information item. Correct. That would be my That's question. Fine. Yeah, and if you'd prefer to send it to teaching and learning first, that would be fine. That would be another option. So why don't we leave it as an information item and then it can go to committee. Okay. Um, I mean, it's already been posted. It's already there. Right. Okay. That's that's fine. And I'm also going to ask to pull the um, the board norms off of the consent agenda. Okay. You can do that when we do the consent okay. form. Okay. So all in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. The agenda is approved. Um, we're now going to move on to hearings from members of the public. Um, thank you to everyone for coming to the meeting tonight to speak. Um, and I want to remind members of the public who wish to um, address the board that pursuant to board policy 206, we ask that you do not duplicate information that has been previously presented. If you have a complaint about indi individual employees, board members, or students in the district, please direct any of these comments to the appropriate site administrator, the superintendent, or submit them in writing to the board. The board typically does not respond to or have discussion on any issues presented, but questions raised during presentations will receive follow-up as directed by the board. I would like to remind all speakers that your presentations are limited to three minutes. When you have 15 seconds left of your three minutes and when your three minutes are finished, I will have a visual prompt for you to notify you um, to finish up your statement and then to finish up your statement at the three minute mark, please. Um, First up is um, Dr. Sarah Preble. So welcome, Dr. Preble. Great. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you all for taking such quick action uh, in the resolution that you discussed at the special meeting earlier with regards to requiring vaccination or weekly testing for staff and teachers. I think it will set a high standard and show the community how important COVID vaccination really is. I work at a major hospital in Minneapolis and they are delaying elective cases starting today, elective surgery cases. This is due to a lack of staffed beds. What is a staffed bed? It means that we don't have enough nurses to care for all the patients that we need to care for. We have ICU patients on ventilators for hours in the ER waiting for an ICU bed. We have people with significant heart attacks sitting in the waiting room of the ER because there aren't enough ER beds. We also have patients in smaller hospitals that need higher levels of care and they can't transfer to our hospital either at all or for many days. Why am I telling a school board about my hospital staffing issues? It's because your actions and the policy of this school board directly affects the surrounding community. Not just our EPS community, not just Edina, but the entire metro and the state of Minnesota. Our community is at high risk right now and everything that you can do to help prevent the transmission of COVID will, prevent our, will benefit our community. 
That's why I'm pretty troubled to see that there was time spent during tonight's special meeting on criteria about when to change the masking requirement. There are so many other important things to deliberate about and masking is an, a necessary thing for the foreseeable future and we need to follow the re recommendations of major public health organizations like MDH and CDC and not make up EPS specific criteria. Let's talk about how to increase vaccination rates in the EPS BIPOC community. Let's talk about how kids eating lunch together in the school rooms during periods of significant or high transmission is gonna to lead to outbreaks in school transmission and multiple exposures and quarantines. Let's talk about screening testing for students and staff. Even if EPS can't immediately support in-school screening testing, you can absolutely send a strong message to the EPS families that weekly testing is an expectation and will help keep kids in school more consistently. You can make them aware of the MDH recommendation and where to easily get tested. And last but not least, let's talk about having a more robust curriculum for students on quarantine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Preble. Next up is Abby Metzler. Hi, I'm Abby Metzler. I have a uh, first grader at Creek Valley Elementary. Um, and I'm also a physician uh, in the area. And I just wanted to kind of share, I didn't prepare much, but let you know kind of my, what our experience has been and where I think we should be focusing more on. Um, so about five days into the school year, we had had, I think, 12 first graders in one classroom and then another handful in another room uh, on quarantine. So those students are out. So of the four classrooms, we do have a significant number out. I know you all were talking about how the numbers are low, but unfortunately that's not been our experience. Um, when those students were quarantined, I was getting messages and talking to the parents about what are we supposed to do? How are they gonna learn? How do they get tested? They didn't get recommendations or sent home with any test kits. Um, they had heard that the state was gonna be providing tests and that didn't happen. So I think we have a lot of um, work to do and I think we should be focusing on how we can best support those students and keep our kids safe right now uh, in the schools in the current situation. I will also put into context that in our communities right now, um, our healthcare systems are not doing well. Um, I work mostly in a clinic, but also do a few weeks in the hospitals and even in the clinic settings, um, we are being asked to see patients with higher acuity, double book patients, see people instead of sending them to the emergency rooms because the emergency rooms are full and understaffed. Um, I will share, a, a, there was a scenario, um, I'm in neurology, so we would typically get all sorts of transfers in at the major tertiary care centers in town from the outside um, centers. And so we have patients with uncontrolled seizures and status epilepticus being managed in emergency rooms in rural areas because we do not have any place to put them. I would echo Dr. Preble in that we have um, people in the emergency rooms who should be in the ICUs and we have no beds in the state to put them in. So the scenario right now, while again, I'm happy to hear that overall our rates are low in school, we are part of the community and I think we need to be doing everything that we can to support our community as well um, and be making sure that the parents and students are safe and know what the plan is and how they can be part of that too. Um, so thank you for the testing and uh, for teachers and the uh, vaccination support. I think that's huge. I would love to see more for students as well and really focusing more on the robust plans now for when students are exposed at school and less about how to take masks off. I would love that to be a priority. We are not there yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Jason Doctor. <coughs> Dr. Stanley, Chair Allenberg, and directors, thank you for the time to speak. First, I want to speak to, oops, and I just lost my page here. Oh, got it. 
Okay, first I would I want to speak to the draft resolution to require EPS staff to be vaccinated against COVID or to submit to regular testing. The EME Governance Board has overwhelmingly voted to support this resolution. We agree that vaccinations are our best tool to keep our students, our colleagues, and our community safe and our schools open. No one asked for our support. Our support is voluntarily given. That is what partnership can look like. Teachers helping to shoulder the load and share the burden of this decision. Shouldering the load is something we are, with which we are familiar. However, in March of 2020, that load increased dramatically. We stepped up and leaned into the work, the sacrifice that needed to be made. We know that you value the work we did and continue to do so. Throughout the spring, summer, and now fall, teachers have received accolades from parents, board members, and district administrators for going above and beyond last year to ensure positive learning environments and opportunities for our students. We now ask for more than words. We appreciated your attendance at our last negotiation session and the message of partnership you brought. We value that partnership as well. To be honest, this round of negotiations has been difficult and a strain on our partnership. Let me try to summarize. We met with the district's negotiation team for the first time on April 19th. We reported that information from our member survey said that salaries and workload were primary concerns. We listed online teaching, support for our equity and anti-racism efforts, and construction of FTEs, specifically special education FTEs, as issues that we would like addressed. We have had very limited success advancing these issues. At times, we have felt that our concerns were dismissed or disregarded. When it came to district concerns and proposals, we felt sometimes threatened and bullied. These perceptions were communicated, and they were received, and they were understood. I only tell you this because it didn't always feel like a partnership. We have moved past this. What had been a contentious environment has become more collaborative. Relationships are being built. On July 7th, we exchanged our first financial proposals. Throughout, we have negotiated in good faith. Our proposals have been reasonable. We feel that we have held up our end of the partnership. We have been cognizant of the district's budget forecasting Re reducing our ask to a point where it would be the smallest total dollar package in 10 years. Every day we have to wait for a new contract is harmful. At a time when we are concerned about the mental health of our students and staff, we don't need this distraction. Every day contributes to teacher stress and anxiety. Let's get this deal done. Let's let our teachers focus on what they love, their students. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Elizabeth Hillstrom. Eliz Elizabeth Hillstrom. Hello. My name, and I leave my mask on, right? I can't, yep. but I'm speaking. My name is Elizabeth Hillstrom, a teacher for 21 years, 18 of those in Edina Public Schools. I'm a two-time nationally board certified educator. And some of you may remember me from commencement last year as I was selected by the student body to be the faculty speaker. I am asking you to reconsider EME's contract offer. I am here with my colleagues to ensure our students walk into a safe and inspiring place every single day. This year, I have 159 students in five classes, an additional 31 in my advisory. That's a total of 190 students, and today, I know every single one of them by name. I'm terrible at names, but I know, I realize how important it is for students to be known by their name, to be seen by other people, and to be heard by their teacher. I don't need to go back to last year to provide you with examples of Edina Public School teachers going above and beyond. I can just go back to yesterday. I took the time yesterday to send the following email to both a parent and EHS student because she had gone out of her way to make Edina a welcoming place last week. I wrote, end quote, I just wanted to say thank you for having such a terrific daughter. She is making our class and our entire school a better place. Last week, she stopped by during flex and another student came in who had shared that they really felt alone in the school. Your daughter went above and beyond as a student and a human being to talk with this individual and let them know that they are not alone, end quote, and email. On Saturday, I reached out to another student who ran her first half marathon yesterday. I wanted to be sure 
that she knew I had really listened to her when she told me what she was undertaking and that I'd be thinking of her on race day. On Friday, I was frantically grading while eating my lunch and a new student to Edina Public Schools came into my room lost and confused. The three different schedules he had to master as a new student at Edina were too much for him. I pushed my lunch aside and my work aside and I said we'd figure this out together. After 10 minutes staring at this very confusing schedule, I interrupted one of my incredible teacher neighbors who set aside her lunch and her work to help us as well. Finally, after 15 minutes, I realized this was going to take a trip to the office, so we went there together. Returning to my classroom, my lunch wasn't eaten, grading unfinished, but I had made a difference in the life of a struggling Adina student. These examples are not of curriculum planning or grading or of, of attending required meetings. The time designated for that during my school day generally becomes time to help students in need. Like last Thursday when Cree walked into my room during my prep hour completely overwhelmed by how to even start the college process. Again, I pushed my work aside because she at that moment was the most important thing I could give my time to. I am not unique. I am the average Edina public school teacher. What I am doing, I learn by watching my amazing colleagues. Not only are we preparing them to be successful college students, we are preparing them to be human beings who care about other people and want to create a better world. Teachers are the greatest resource Edina public schools has. Please acknowledge that with actions as well as words. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Shannon Seaver. Shannon, Shannon Seaver. I'm not as bubbly. <laughs> I'm Shannon Seaver and um, Dr. Stanley and Chair Allenberg and board members, I'm here to talk about our, what we've been doing this last year over and above and beyond. Uh, a couple things in the last year, as you guys know, we've learned how to pivot, which is a word that we consider a swear word now. <laughs> and um, so, but hearing from the doctors in the community, I have a feeling we're going to need to learn to pivot again. So we need to have that understood that that may need to happen. Um, I gave up my family time to keep um, our, my head above water with the students and with teaching both class and virtual. It's, it doubled the load. Uh, and um, we also had to come up with our own virtual content. And especially with videotaping, you can imagine how much more time that took. Um, I was also available for my students after school because a lot of them were taking care of their siblings and couldn't do school during the day because they were doing school with their siblings and then had to do their own schoolwork. So I had to be available at night. So I put in 12 to 15 hour days, easy. Um, but even in, in, despite all of that, uh, I teach uh, AP computer science. My AP scores went up 20%. So 20% more students passed the, uh, the AP test. Um, I taught summer school and helped those kids that struggled last year and they all passed. And after that, I took four weeks of training so that I could teach engineering classes this fall. So I only had two weeks off this year. Um, worked day after day, I, oh, and last year I had, I had a hysterectomy. And the day after, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just, it's truth. Um, the day after I started teaching the day after. And I have another colleague that had a surgery and started teaching the day after her surgery as well and lost a lot of sick days and didn't get those back. I got mine back, but she didn't. Um, so um, we also, I'm sure many of us had to upgrade our internet. That's a big cost, you know, um, just to make sure that we could communicate and do what we needed to do to do our job. And lastly, um, I'm one of the eight people that last year got nationally board certified in the middle of all this. And I found that that process was harder than getting a master's in math. So that, if you can imagine, that was a lot of work and trying to make it work with kids at home, kids there, and so on. So I just wanted to say, um, I, I plead with you guys to consider what the contract will be and that we should at least get inflationary meeting. You know, how will you be happy with yourselves if we have to pivot again and the teachers are having to go above beyond but didn't get inflationary meeting of our 
salaries. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Alex Gold. Alex Gold. Hello. Um, my name is Alex Galt. I'm a math teacher at the high school. Um, and I have had so much fun this year. I get to see kids in the room and we get to like correct a factoring mistake on the fly and then move on. We get to um, play 24, which is really fun in the classroom. Um, we get to, it's a math game, don't worry, we're still doing math. Um, we get to, um, you know, just see each other and just talk. And, and it's something that I really missed last year. I worked really hard last year without that kind of joy. I worked all year. I created the entire AP Calculus curriculum, BC Online, so that every single lesson was a video. And I, I'm really happy that those videos exist, but um, I also had two little kids at home, so I was doing that while I was trying to figure out what their Google Classroom meant. Um, and I just, um, it was all around me. Teachers were working really hard last year and the joy was missing. Um, and I just want to warn you about, um, you don't want to lose us. You want us to teach your children. We, you want people who have the joy of seeing people in the room and, and the joy of, of being with young people. We love it. And so you, you just, don't want to deprive us of a living wage um, when, as a math person, I could get a different job. I love this job. So please pay me to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Kim Castor. Kim Castor. Kim Castor. Hi everybody, my name is Kim Castor. Um, I'm starting my 22nd year of working in the French department, the world language department at the high school, and I also work on um, student council, which includes homecoming and all the other events during the year. I would like to start by saying that the dedication of this teaching staff behind me and the, entire, and the people that are not here tonight did not start in March 2020. You know this as well because you've heard the accolades at least for the 20 years that I've been here. It's been one thing that keeps me coming back. I was only gonna stay five years because that was a part of my international travel plan but somehow the time seemed to have disappeared. Before March 2020, we were already meeting with kids. We were already innovative. We were already working the technology to the best of our ability and to keep kids engaged. And for sure in the language classes, we were asking kids to speak the language, participate, be up, be moving, et cetera. So what happened last year? In my department, we were doing Google Meets for four days a week because how do you get a kid to learn a language other than speaking it? They have to be there. But at the same time, they're, that meant that we had to give up a full Saturday, a full Sunday, sometimes both, evenings to be ready for the next day, even with the Wednesdays that we graciously got by the, throughout the rest of the year. It was tough to be ready, and in my own situation, I have five different Schoology pages that do not connect, so each time I posted something had to be in each time I posted something. We had office hours, as you've heard tonight, that were in the evening, when it worked for kids, it was helping kids get better for test scores on the AP test or helping kids be ready to be mentally capable to turn their camera on, hopefully, and talk in a language class or just be there because it was hard to be anywhere at the middle of the year. We were redesigning lessons to make sure that they worked online to keep kids engaged. We have always given 200% and COVID did not change that. And now that we're back in person, I can tell you as a student council person, we've asked the high school staff to participate. Shh, it's a secret. Somehow in homecoming, it's an overwhelming response because they want to help us build the culture and to help kids feel spirit and identity. Now that we have two classes that really don't understand what it is to be a high school student, we're helping kids figure out how to be in person and around other people since they've been home for, over, for 18 months. And we're rethinking our lessons that we were doing before COVID to make sure that they're in class worthy because at least for me at the high school, juniors and seniors, 
we kind of have to make sure they're getting their money's worth. Otherwise, they, why am I here? I could do this online. Last year, honestly, was the hardest year in my 27 years of teaching. Obviously, not all of them here. It was harder than my student teaching year. It was harder than teaching internationally. And I know that the summer, I needed every single day to recharge and be ready and start this fall. So please help me focus on my classroom, help us focus on our classroom, and find a settlement soon. Thank you. Uh, Debbie Krengel. Debbie Krengel. Everybody is so well spoken already and I'm nervous, so just be aware of that. Um, my name is Debbie Kringle. This is my 21st year as a teacher in Edina Public Schools. The first 16 years I was a special ed teacher at Concord Elementary. And the four years prior to this, I've been a peer coach in the district. And as a peer coach, I have a privilege of working with teachers from early childhood all the way up to high school. I get to have conversations about their goals and best practice. I hear them challenge themselves to continuously innovate and meet the needs of every student. And it's an amazing job. I'm so lucky to have it. And it gives me a broad picture of how our students experience the district from their early years to their senior year. So knowing that my colleagues and I have started this school year without a finalized contract pushed me to speak tonight. Last night, as I was trying to compose my thoughts for this meeting to figure out a way to share the immense level of dedication and expertise we have in this district, I kept getting stuck. It's just not possible to capture it all in three minutes or less. So I crossed out the parts that made me teary. And so I think I feel like I'm going to get through it. Um, in the last 18 months, we've all done work we never thought we would or could do. I've seen teachers learn new technology platforms in just days. I've seen teachers carve out instructional spaces from their dining room tables and corners of their basements. I've seen support staff react quickly and definitively to meet the mental health needs of our students. I've seen elementary teachers in our virtual academies create a whole new definition of what it means to be a classroom fostering an incredible sense of community and connection and achievement for kids who needed school to exist in the safety of their own home. I've seen early childhood special education teachers serve as coaches and cheerleaders for parents who are isolated at home. I've seen teachers on screen and in front of classrooms and nobody likes to be in front of the classroom. They like to be moving in the classroom. They were all doing the best they could and our best in this district is exceptional. So, in the hundreds of conversations I've had with our licensed staff in the last 18 months, we've been scared and we've been vulnerable and we've been committed and we've had to remind ourselves that the essence of teaching, the essence of working with our students and families hasn't changed. This isn't an easier year. We do get the energy and joy of having students in front of us. We get to collaborate with each other in person, having spontaneous conversations about our work and our lives. We're connected again, and being connected feels great. But there's still a lot of uncertainty, and there are a lot of unknowns to navigate. And starting this school year without a contract in place is an uncertainty we shouldn't have to carry. I know you've recognized and appreciated the work we did in the last year and a half, and we know how hard it's been to lead our district through all of these challenges. This work of leading a district is a partnership and we are here for it. Thank you. Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy. My name is Mike McCarthy and I've been teaching fifth grade at Concord since 1999. I assume we're all familiar with our district mission statement, but in my 22 years here, time and time again, I've seen educators also live by an unofficial mission statement. We'll make it work. When the pandemic hit, students and teachers had to instantly adapt to a makeshift online school and families had to adapt to not having childcare as well as managing learners at home. In my house, we had both as my wife teaches and we had one and three year old boys who no longer went to daycare. Together, we needed to coordinate schedules for two classrooms along with snacks, naps, and diaper changes, 
all while under the constant threat of a naked toddler crashing a live math lesson. <laughs> Many of my peers handled similar and even more challenging situations while remaining fully dedicated to serving our students. It wasn't perfect, but through it all, we said, we'll make it work. Last August, just a week before workshops, I learned I'd be part of the Edina Virtual Academy. In a matter of two weeks, we invented a completely new school out of thin air. The dedication, innovation, and perseverance shown by my EVA fifth grade team was limitless. I lost track of the number of times we were all in communication working late into the night as we prepared both live and flip lessons for the next day. We were united by our common mission. We'll make it work. For those teaching in person, it was even more challenging. Starting hybrid, going online, back to hybrid, finally to full classrooms in the spring. Despite the stress and demands of constant change, uncertainty and reinvention pushing many of our teachers to their limits and beyond, one of my the hardest working colleagues left teaching completely after this year. Less stress, more money in the business world. The sentiment was the same, we'll make it work. Meanwhile, with my EVA students, we took on the challenge of creating an authentic learning community with kids from three completely different elementary schools. It took time, it took effort, but they showed up every day to our meets, ear to see each other and ear to learn. On the last day of school, when many of us finally met in person for the first time, in our excitement and our happiness and joy, we knew we made it work. Through it all, no matter the challenge, over and over again, we'll make it work. From August 2019 to August 2021, the median home price in Edina has increased 15%. Teradel and Knotts are going for a half a million dollars. The robust health of the property tax base that partially funds the schools is largely driven by families moving here because of our outstanding schools and educators. In June, the governor and the legislator agreed on the largest school funding increase in 15 years. Two weeks ago, the US Department of Ed announced the approval of $1.3 billion in federal funding for Minnesota's American Rescue Plan. In contrast, as Jason mentioned, EME is only asking for the smallest total dollar settlement in 10 years. So, in light of all this, I remain hopeful the negotiations team can return to the table in good faith and find a way to say, we'll make it work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for speaking tonight. Um, I appreciate everyone's engagement with the board and we're going to move on to a presentation about the first day of school um, through the eyes of leaders. All right, I'm going to invite Dr. Smazel to come up and uh, we are going to have an opportunity to just talk about um, what those first few days of school have been like uh, through, through our eyes, through some principal's eyes, and once he gets settled in there, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Good evening. I'm uh, Lee Bird, and I work at the Edina Early Learning Center. Watch the video. It's been wonderful to welcome him. Go for it. Sorry. <laughs> I can assume Zach can hear me in the back. Uh, good evening, Dr. Stanley, Chair Allenberg, uh, school board members, uh, community members, staff, students. Uh, we are excited to have the start of the school year upon us. I've had uh, many opportunities to talk with staff and administrators out in the schools, and I know that they're excited about seeing the kids, being able to make connections in a way that we're most familiar with, uh, being back in face-to-face -face instruction. We welcome over 8,400 students uh, back to our schools this fall, so we're excited about that. We have launched, as many of you know, a five-section uh, online elementary uh, learning program under the umbrella of Highlands Elementary this year. That's a, that's a new program, but it's kind of a carryover from what we did with the online learning last year. Um, and we still are continuing to work on a day-by-day -day basis with some of the challenges that COVID presents to us, whether it is analyzing our masking and other mitigation pro protocols constantly or monitoring uh, tracking for uh, positive cases or managing some of the transportation issues that we've had with the uh, challenges of finding uh, enough drivers and being able to maintain that. 
We've had a great uh, kickoff this fall, um, led by Dr. Stanley, uh, welcoming our staff back. And I know that our orientations and our open houses have been well attended, and uh, there's been a lot of excitement in those uh, spaces as well. And uh, with that, we'd like to just show a little celebration video from some of our different levels. We have Leah Bird here from uh, er the Early Learning Center and Karen Bergman from Countryside Elementary. Uh, Toya Pryor, our new uh, principal at Valley View, and then Andy Beaton will finish it off from the high school. So, Zach, can you play the video? At our kids and families, while at the same time making some new friends. I'm happy to share that our baby and toddler ECFD classes are once again full, as well as our morning preschool, and we have two all day pre K programs with wraparound care. It's been wonderful coming back together as a learning community. And we are so grateful for all of the support from our Edina community for our youngest learners. Hi everyone, Karen Bergman, Principal at Countryside Elementary. We are off to an amazing start to our new school year. It was great welcoming our students and their families back through Open House a few weeks ago. And now we have all of our students with us here every day and it is a great joy. We're ready for more opportunities for our families to join us and participate in all of the great things going on. Hello everyone, my name is Foya Pryor. I am the principal at Valley Middle School. We are off to an amazing start this year. Our fantastic team has spent time aligning the Valley Middle School vision with the district vision. We have been laser focused on building a safe and inclusive community of compassionate, lifelong learners who discover their talents and embrace their authentic selves. It's been nothing short of amazing to see our scholars in school every day. And a special thank you to our families that have been supporting throughout this journey. We appreciate your partnership. Hey Hornets, Andy Beaton here. Just want to give a thank you to our families for your support, for our students who have really done a great job following our protocols and our staff uh, for getting us ready for the school year. It's really been an exciting start. We are very full. Uh, we have lots of students here um, at the high school and uh, it's really been a tremendous start. So appreciate all your efforts and we'll see you soon. So our formula is simple. It's uh, safety, inclusion, and relationships, and those things add up to launch learning for kids. And so we want to have those kinds of environments available for all of our learners. And uh, with that, we'd like to celebrate the kickoff of the 21-22 school year. <laughs> for sure. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smazel. I want to add that I have been out into each and every one of our schools, and it has been amazing uh, for the teachers who are here, thank you. I've had an opportunity to meet with most of you, um, either in, in school group meetings or um, taking some lessons in, in, in your classrooms. I had the opportunity to participate in art lessons and French lessons. And last week, I loved being able to come out and read to the kindergartners. That was one of the highlights. Uh, I've had outdoor lunch. I've had indoor lunch. <laughs> So it's been a great experience. And then really just seeing our um, early learning center students, our, our youngest hornets come back to school and just how excited they were, how excited their families were and just um, the newness of school. You forget that a little bit until you look, look at school through the eyes of a four-year-old or a three-year-old. It is a really big deal. So um, it has been an amazing return to school, and I am so happy to have all of our students back in school in person. Thank you, Dr. Stanley and Dr. Smazel. Um, we're now going to move on to our consent agenda, and I know there was a request to move board norms. Is there a request to remove anything else? No? Okay. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. We'll now vote to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Do I have a motion to approve um, school board norms? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, so the school board norms were reviewed at our board retreat on August 28th, and two changes were discussed at that retreat that were recommended to the norms for this fall. Um, one being that Dr. Stacy Stanley suggested to help her from a meeting management perspective 
Um, so you'll see under the section meeting protocols, um, bullet point three, um, it only says superintendent now as opposed to team members and superintendent. The second change was requested by Director Jones who wanted to add under the communications portion, number three, um, it says to speak and or write in an official board capacity as opposed to just speak. So those are the two changes that were made. The intent from the board retreat was to make these two changes and then have a more thorough review of the board norms when the new board is seated in January. Um, so I'll no, now open it up to any discussion about those two changes or anything else. I don't need to have any, any discussion. My interest in removing it from consent is there are some issues on the board norms that I haven't agreed with and I've never voted in favor of it. So um, that's just all. So I'm prepared to have a vote. I'm just confused. You didn't. Did you have it removed off? I thought Ellen. Ellen did, did but I would second. I would go along oh. with her. So it's just a procedural thing for me. Oh, I just was curious why Ellen, what her thoughts were since one of the changes were something she said at the board retreat. Yeah, no, I I still agree with um, making that one change. Um, in the past, I've not agreed with the communications pro uh, protocols that are written in there, and and they. While the board has changed those, um, that we really haven't changed our, our board no, norms to really mirror what's going on right now. And, um, and the, other, the other part of, I mean, there's just details throughout that I have been uncomfortable with before. Um, and there has been an other changes. There's um, some wording changes in here. Um, that were not called out. Um, something I'm looking at meeting protocols. Um, the word um, a word was inserted for a regular meeting, and um, actually it was it has to do with uh, the meeting agenda, um, uh, making being able to make changes to uh, agenda items at regular meetings. I would I would want to change that to regular meetings and work sessions, um, and or special meetings if, if enough um, uh, uh, um, notice was given. So I, I, there are enough there that I, I don't think I will be supporting these. Okay. Um, Can I make one quick yeah, comment? Yeah, absolutely. So I just wanna, um, I wanna support um, the conversation that we had at the board retreat that um, none of these issues did not come up at the board retreat in my memory that you guys just brought up right now. So we had talked about these two changes and then revisiting this with the new board seated um, in January. So um, I'm in support of that plan that we all discussed at the board retreat, um, not knowing that these were concerns that were still um, lingering or going on. So I just wanted to make clarification that that's where we were. I think we I think we all acknowledge that there are things that need to be tweaked and updated. The process that we defined at the retreat was to make these quick changes because we didn't have time nor we all acknowledge that there are up to four new board members that are going to be here um, and that the best process would be to make these two quick changes and then have a more thorough review um, coming up. Yeah, that's my recollection too. Thank you. And, and for the public, we have had, um, I don't know, two, three, four, lengthy, robust discussions uh, earlier this year and maybe at the end of last year that were fair uh, and extensive. And um, um, I had some issues with things like recognize the distinction between monitoring data and management data. I don't see that distinction. And for that reason and a few others, I can't accept the board norms as they're written. But we have had a fair discussion and uh, we've had the vote on it in the past. So it's been procedurally um, appropriate and fair. So I'll, I'll just note that we have had, as Owen said, previous discussions and I think that everybody on the board is aware of the various positions of people on the board and it really wasn't necessary at the retreat for Owen or Ellen to go through the whole litany or their, their issues from before. So in fact, I appreciate the fact that they didn't because they were discussed and um, so that's about it. Okay, all those in favor of the board norms, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, the board norms are approved. Um, we're now going to move on to discussion. Um, the first item up for discussion is Dr. Randy Smazel with the 2022-2023 and 2023-2024 school year learning calendar. A student, a senior at the high school, and has been a part of our discussions with the calendar committee conversation. With that, I'm going to have Harper kick us off with our vision statement. Great. So, um, as you said, thank you for having me. My name is Harper. I'm a senior this year. Um, we wanted to emphasize that throughout our um, meetings of the calendar committee, we reminded ourselves to keep in mind the district motto, which is to that defining excellence to achieve our vision and for each sorry uh, for each and every student to discover their possibilities and thrive thank you harper with that we'll uh hand it off to kate to uh give us a little background about the committee itself sure so the calendar committee was charged with proposing new calendars for the 22-23 and the 23-24 school years to the school board in September, which is what brought us here to talk to you tonight. The calendar committee this year consisted of the assistant superintendent, Dr. Schmazel, the director of human resources, the director of communications, two building administrators, a district cultural liaison, a community and service coordinator, or, yeah, and two parents, six teachers, and then of course Harper joined the team, which was awesome to have a student on the team. Thank you, Kate. Um, some of the work that we did around the calendar uh, involved at first discussing with the board some of the board parameters for, for building out those calendars. And in the board parameters, we define context and reality. We define the desired results and some of the unacceptable means. Uh, the calendars themselves should support the learning process, of course, accommodate much of the construction that we do every year in Edina, address breaks and professional development and conferences and day-to-days which are built into it, and then also acknowledge the needs of our families. Uh, we did have a variety of different discussions along the way. Uh, we look at statute, we look at making sure that we achieve enough hours of instruction per that statute that's listed in there. Uh, we did talk to other districts along the way as well in terms of, uh, and looked at some of the materials they had put out about how they structure their calendars. And then talked a lot about different types of breaks and how to organize that time. We know that the breaks are an important part of the learning process as they help refresh and rejuvenate and get people ready for that intensive learning that sits in Edina Public Schools. And uh, we also continue to talk about when we collect student learning data and how we do that, how that fits into the calendar process. We talk about how and when teachers collaborate and how and when teachers receive professional learning. All of you know that the, the intensity of professional learning continues to increase as expectations of what teachers are able to do continues to leverage higher. And then also how we communicate learning with parents and when that happens and speaking to conferences and things like that. Um, we also discussed some of the different activities that kids participate in and how that lays out in the calendar and how the calendar aligns to that. And also looked at previous work that was done around calendars, both board presentations and data collection that was done with the community. Uh, so all of those informed our discussions across the time period of six weeks that has led us to uh, the proposals that were here to speak with you about this evening. So we have two options that we wanna talk about and they're subtly different. Um, what we did to generate these options is we had a large group of staff that went through a level up training, if you will, about professional learning communities. It was teachers and administrators, about 130. And these, this group of 130 
is charged with help us helping us lead professional learning communities to another level in Edina Public Schools moving forward. And we began to launch what's called our PLC playbook in Edina and really working on the first three plays as we head into the fall. So as we discussed um, early releases and how those are used to help professional learning communities collaborate and look at student data and make decisions about learning, the calendar committee made a recommendation that we do a little focus group work with that group of 130 because they are the most trained and the most recently trained group that's receiving some of the uh, latest and greatest about professional learning community work across the country. So we did talk to that group and that helped evolve into these two proposals. Jen will talk a little bit about um, some of the data that we found from that group and uh, the proposals involve uh, an idea or a way that we could phase early releases out of the system, provided that we're able to manage that collaboration time in the rest of the calendar. So I'm gonna turn that over to Jen to speak a little bit about. So as you can see from the visual, um, early releases are different you know, at every single level, but collaboration needs to be central. And so there was interest from the groups in the open-ended responses. They spoke to wanting the collaboration, but the challenges that exist with the early releases. And so we felt our, um, our group really wanted the two proposals to be able to try to try something new or go back on the traditional model of having the four early releases throughout the year. So that's where options A and B came from. Thank you, and with that, we'll turn it to Harper to talk a little bit about some of the attributes that sit in our existing calendar proposals. So for both the 2022 through 23 and 2023 through 24 calendars, we have a pre-Labor Day start date for the school year, as well as 171 student contact days and two connect and assess days for the kindergarten through fifth grade elementary schoolers. Uh, there's also five professional development days six in option B and um, then 170 student contact days. Two data days, uh, one, at the begin or one at the end of semester one and one at the end of semester two for a teacher grading. There are 16 hours of parent-student teacher conferences and four early releases in option A only, but option B has no early releases and they all collect into one non-student contact day. And then there's a two-day MEA break with a two-week winter break and a one-week spring break. And all of these attributes uh, meet the minimum hour requirements for uh, the statute 120A.41. So really the differences between A and B um, are similar. Option A is gonna have you know, the similar to the past calendars with four early release days throughout the year versus option B has one day of eight hours, um, that is in April, April 21st in 2023, and April 29th, or 19th in 2024. We worked very hard to keep things aligned throughout the district, um, both early learning through the high school. We, as Randy talked about with the PLC playbook, we're going to continue to coordinate weekly PLC time throughout the district, but then some of that collaborative time would be embedded in those professional learning days. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about connect and assess days. That's as those would be new to our district. So when thinking about innovative ways to align our calendar with the district's vision and mission, one of the ideas was adding connect and assess days for our kindergarten through fifth grade students. <clears throat> These days are already being used in some of the surrounding districts, including Bloomington and Shakopee. If approved, these first two days of of the year would be used to build relationships between teachers, students, and families to set goals and complete assessments. We feel this practice aligns with the core beliefs of Edina Public Schools, including but not limited to starting the family school collaboration on day one, completing assessments so that moving toward academic excellence can start on day one, and inclusion by allowing each student to have individual time with their teachers prior to school starting. Thank you, Kate. Um, in terms of a future calendar process, we had intended to have a rolling calendar developed um, prior to COVID. We got a little bit behind and distracted with some other elements and we wanna get back to that process. So what we've proposed this evening is a two year calendar and then we would reconvene next fall and prepare the following year calendar and then would continue to do that each year. So trying to stay about two years out um, 
for the board and for the community, I think would be helpful. And with that, we will pause and say thank you. And I would like to publicly thank all the committee members who worked very hard over the last six weeks and a lot of discussion and debate and see what questions our board has for us. Great. Thank you all so much. And uh, I want to echo the thank, thank you to the committee members, those that presented tonight and those that are not here tonight. And I'll just open it up to the rest of the board for any questions or comments that board members have. I see Owen trigger happy with this uh, <laughs> button right there. So go ahead, Owen. Thank you, Chair Allenberg. Two uh, comments, one of which is I am excited that we're trying something creative with the early release dates because among other things, they've been tough on the families to plan for time to have somebody at home. So I think that this is really good that you're thinking about ways to shift that, and not lose the benefit that that had been providing for the staff. The second thing is really, I'm really excited about when I'm hearing about Connect and the access, uh, assess days um, because I think it's uh, imperative that we jump in and find out where the kids are at right away before we get the, the teaching and the interventions. And so we've got a, a pretty good benchmark of where the kids are at. So, um, And then there's an emphasis on connecting with the kids. So I think that's a real good initiative. Julie? Yeah, I have one question. Um, I echo everything that Owen just said, um, almost word for word, so I, that's all great. I have a question. In January, um, we always have two back-to-back -back three day weekends. I'm sure you guys have looked at that, right? Where there's three days in the middle of the week. And I'm just curious if you guys looked at attendance at during that week for, for kids. And like, I mean, I know there are, there's always a series of three day weekends or four day weekends in that January, February time frame. But that one in particular, I just always, I'm just curious. I'm not, I don't have an opinion about it either way. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are with a three day week in the middle of that sandwiched in there. So it is sandwiched right in the middle and it falls right around finals at the high school. Um, right. It's closing up semester one and semester two at the middle schools. Um, so we really looked at overall that year in terms of the testing schedule. Um, ultimately, we'd love if we could have finals before um, we go to winter break. Right. It's just not possible with the number of days to keep the semesters equal. Um, and so they actually, the three-day weekends kind of fall, you know, there's a three-day week with that data day on Friday. So it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And those are the finals at the high school. That those makes sense. The finals at the high school. Okay. Thank you, and I know that there's always options too. Sometimes students will take it ahead of time or they won't have a final, they'll have a, okay, great. Thanks, that's a good Thank clarification. You. Janie? Hi. Um, first, Kate, thank you for all of your years of dedication to the calendar committee. For those that don't know, Kate could do a calendar in her sleep. She's amazing. So, And she's the one that counts the days. Um, so a couple things. One, I am a huge supporter of the rolling calendar, so thank you for keeping that at the forefront. I'm also in support of collapsing the early release days and turning it into one day. I have a couple questions about the connect and assess days. I absolutely love the idea, the concept, everything that can be done, and I think it wholeheartedly supports what we're trying to do. My questions kind of revolve around, would, is the expectation that the parent would be with the child? And if it is, I'm wondering what kind of conversations have happened, um, maybe with Val, with Kids Club, just making sure that this is an equitable opportunity for students so that we have childcare opportunities for them, um, is, if transportation is a barrier in making this happen. Like, how can we work as a district to make sure those days are successful? I'm totally assuming that you guys have thought through the whole, this is the right number of hours for the students to be in school, all of that, but I just wanna make sure that there's a lot of thought behind making those as successful as possible because I think the intention behind them is amazing. So so yes, I can speak to the connect and assess days a little bit more. Um, I've experienced them as a parent in my home district and uh, it's just been a really welcoming way to start a school year. Uh, most of the time, I think in both the districts that I looked at, it is the parents and children at an assigned time going. Usually they have like a 20 minute, 30 minute time slot. Typically, the parents will wait outside the classroom while the teacher takes a child in to do a quick math and reading assessment to get some baseline so that they don't have to do it during their instructional time with all of the students there. 
And in the meantime, the parents are often filling out paperwork about their goals and priorities for their child that year. And then the teacher comes back to the table with the student and they meet all together and talk about those goals and priorities for the year. So it really is a great time to connect, to individually different than open house when the teacher is trying to manage all 30 sets of students and parents in the classroom, they can really make that individual connection. We did have uh, Rachel Hicks who organizes community ed services for kids club and, and before after school care. And so she was part of those discussions as far as being able to offer days for kids to be at school. We didn't discuss transportation to school or what it means for parents having to get off of work and come in, but we did think about the kids and the kids care for those two days being added on to the year. So the, so the thought behind if there was a child who needed to be at school that morning for child care reasons, but then maybe their appointment time was later, that, that there would be a place for them. Maybe they could still bus into school, still bus home. Okay. I just want to make sure we're thinking. Obviously, I assume you guys are thinking through all that stuff. Thank you. Could, um, and, and my one question about that, first of all, thank you for all your work. I think it... it I totally agree with what has been stated in support of all of this. But I'm, I'm wondering though, if there is some flexibility on those two days. Um, if, you know, it, there are many families that just cannot get off of work during the day. And I'm really concerned that I don't want those kids to feel as if um, they're behind, and, and I'm wondering if you could shift some hours to the evening. Yeah, I think that's a great possibility. That's what we do with conference days. You know, we have a couple of comp days during the school year that we use for evening conferences so that we can meet um, parents' schedules and their work schedules. And so I think that's one of the possibilities that could happen, that we could shift some hours to 8 to noon those days or however you want to do it and look at it a little differently. I absolutely think that's a possibility. Great. Thank you. Um, and the, the other question that I had, uh, and we talked about it a little bit, is it's that the fact that the additional day is in April. Could you speak a little bit to how that, how that fits with the other days um, and how you see this being used by the teachers? I can speak to why we chose April. Um, dependent on where um, spring break falls, the spring can come to sometimes be a longer time that students are in school because you have it, it's broken up more in the fall. And so we tried to find a place where it was, you know, in the middle of MCA testing and it would only be one day, so it wouldn't be disruptive of that because that's something that goes on in grades three through 12. Um, and in addition, we wanted um, to find something that kind of worked in terms of like possibly planning for next year. That was a big conversation topic that we had in terms of looking at, you know, uh, district-wide PLCs and really collaborating on the data that we've been collecting throughout the year. At, at times, I'll also say that we do do curriculum adoptions and we purchase new materials and we offer training to staff. And sometimes it's difficult to get that training in before workshop week in the fall. So it does give us an access point to staff prior to launching off in the summer. And then they're able to receive those materials, receive that training ahead of time. And then as Jen mentioned, it does offer another opportunity to impact learning in the last five to six weeks of school. There is a chunk of school still left after that April day. May is a very solid learning month and it does give us one last push and one last opportunity to uh, have our teachers collaborate on things that need to happen with student learning between that point and the end of the school year. Great, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, I know I spoke to you briefly about this, Director Smozel or Assistant Superintendent Smozel. I apologize. Um, okay. Did we check with um, Troy Stein about making sure spring break did not fall in the middle of major tournaments? I did. The dates, I think this turned off, the dates are not um, published for 2023. Okay. But they are published for 2022. Okay. Typically we see... Um, some of those events happen a little bit earlier in the month. And if we go back to October of 2019, we surveyed 2,914 parents. Those were the responses anyhow. 
and we ask for some preference data on when do you want this break in the spring. And we gave them some options, and what surfaced to the top was that third week of March is the sweet spot. If you can get it in that third week, that's where most of the parents across the district had preferred it, and that's what they gave us back for data. So we went back to that data set to try and figure out what is, where's the best place to place this particular break. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Great. This is great. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to a return to school update, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Stanley. All right. Thank you very much. So it's hard to believe that it was almost a month ago that we came here. Thank you. Uh, to put forward that uh, the team and I came to put forward our initial um, proposal for return to school plan. And as part of that plan, there were some components, including providing an update. And so this is intended to be an update. As one of those plans, um, we notified the community that we would be creating a metric monitoring guidance regarding masking. And we had a conversation about this during the work session. Uh, some things that I noted in feedback that we received back is that rather than using the chart format here, that we would create a decisive flow chart, that we would need to clarify which metric, is it city, is it county, or is it site, that will be used in the event that um, one of the metrics is different from the others. Um, there was a, a request to connect with trend data on uh, quarantine and vaccination rates, which uh, in just a moment I'll share some of that information. And that we, rather than looking at age range, we would look at a grade band. I am wondering if there's any other feedback at this point. And I don't have feedback. I just wanted to note from a process perspective that it would be coming back to the board on September 28th. Yep. The only thing I wanted to add in is I had um, suggested that we add in some information about testing and how testing fits into the story about how we're monitoring. I understand this ask was for masking, but I think it's an important piece to add in what we're doing currently and what we're going to be talking about adding in. Thank you for that reminder. I appreciate that. Any other feedback? Dr. Stanley, we talked about this briefly at the work session. Could you elaborate just a little bit about the, uh, the nature of the testing? Yes, and actually that is part, part of this presentation. Oh, you're going to go through if, that. If you're willing to oh, oh, wait. wait just a moment. Okay. Yes. No, that's okay. Uh, and, just, and it is part of this, yeah. this presentation. And I, um, I would like to make sure that we are, for me, I'm not an expert in any of this, and I just am I'm wondering, when I look at something like this, I want to make sure that we're following CDC and MDH um, recommendations. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for me to understand, from looking at this, what is what when we are following it and when we're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, I can give a little bit of information about that. Well, first of all, from CDC, you'll remember that we moved into universal masking because uh, communities were in high or substantial community transmission. That is what caused across the United States us to move into universal in, or the recommendation for universal indoor masking. And so that is from the CDC. <clears throat> Vaccination rates, um, while early on, you know, we had heard many different times about 
um, herd immunity, right? And we had heard first if you get 65%, next if you get 85%. I have been um, out there researching and uh, what Dr. Fauci said is you, you have to look at your own community vaccination rates and you have to look at how your own community vaccination rates may be impacting um, positively, right, the community spread. So limiting the community spread. Um, and so that that is where that comes from. The quarantine rates uh, prior to COVID uh, in schools, uh, in particular related to influenza, the Minnesota Department of Education used to look at the percentage of students within a classroom within a school that um, were demonstrating influenza-like symptoms. Now, I want to be clear to the community, in no way, shape, or form am I saying that COVID-19 and any of the variants are the same as influenza at all whatsoever. I'm just sharing where I'm getting this from. And what they used to look at is, is a 5% threshold. And so that is where the 5% comes from. And that came from the Minnesota Department of Education. Of course, it was prior to COVID-19 and related to, um, again, the influenza rates. At that time, you know, we certainly weren't calling it quarantining our students or anything like that. We would send them home though. And the classroom was closed down until Do you want this? It's always a sign, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, classrooms were closed down until, you know, certainly we could disinfect and then students uh, were demonstrating uh, that they had, did not have um, influenza symptoms. So that is where that information came from. So it was not just uh, randomly, if you will, selected and I do realize that uh, COVID-19 and its variants are not the same as influenza. Could I ask really quickly, and, and I meant to ask this in the work session, so I apologize. This plan, this has, uh, Dr. Kelly has, has he seen this? Was he a part of the development of it? And, Dr. Kelly has seen it, okay. and um, what Dr. Kelly would advocate for is that our students would remain masked. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Thank you. Remain masked for how long? Indefinitely? I think through the lens of Dr. Kelly, the best way to keep our kids safe and healthy is that they would remain masked. Not indefinitely, <laughs> but through the life of the pandemic, I think is what, let's not yep. scare anyone. Yeah, <laughs> not well, yes, indefinitely. Obviously we're talking yeah, about during the yeah. pandemic and you know, even the information you provided. Uh, he, um, I'm sorry about that, Lenny. Um, one of the things that he spoke about is the fact that we don't have immunizations for our elementary students. And that is a really key factor for him that um, he really recommends that we have to take that into consideration um, when we're thinking about moving away from universal masking. But based on this information right now, that's not even on the table because we're not in any. No, we are currently we're not close to any of these metrics. Correct. We so this are, is for like thinking ahead down the road. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Again, community asked for metrics. I've continued to receive email from families looking at metrics, and I thought that it was, it's responsible. It's being responsive. That we needed to put together. Um, a plan for what that would look like. Right now, um, according to last set of information that I received, uh, the community of Edina is in high transmission. And so we would not move beyond universal masking at this point. I think that's an important clarification, Julie. And just to make sure, 
community members and parents understand loud and clear that the creation of the metric is not an indication that we are in any place that we would be recommending a change. But I do believe that there is value in creating a metric and evaluating what's been put forth. So I just want to make sure that those that there is a distinction there. Well, and we, from a process perspective, we told the community that we would evaluate in 30 days and that metrics needed to be established by then so we had something to evaluate on. And so we need to keep our commitment to the community to go through this process. What The 38 days is the September 28th that I said that we would be meeting again um, at that point, so. Yes, and that's because school started on August 30th, and so that's why yep. we're looking at the 28th. Yep. And just to confirm with the community, Dr. Kelly is in an advisory role, and his recommendation is not binding, and we are trying to derive a criterion upon which that decision would be made. And so we're talking here about, for instance, a 25, or I'm sorry, 85% vaccination threshold would um, more likely put us into a masking strong recommendation as opposed to universal masking. So that's what this is. It's a build out for that criterion. Yes, and if conditions for community transmission allowed that. So it's not just that vaccination rates are high, but it's that our community transmission mm -hmm. and other circumstances allow it. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I say that. So people didn't hear that all of a sudden yes. vaccination rates are going to trigger a change. And will you? And you will be presenting the board and the community with the um, what is the standard or what is the number for high and substantial, moderate and low. Yes. Okay. Okay. So another. Uh, agreement that we made was to move to a localized COVID-19 monitoring page. Um, we heard loud and uh, clear from the community that uh, they wanted to get updates on our fully vaccinated students um, and staff. And I need to be clear that we don't have access to that information yet. We do not have uh, the release for that data for, for the adults in our system. Um, our community wanted to know about our confirmed cases and the quarantines that are in our schools. And so I'm going to share with you a page that will go live after this meeting. And while it is pulling up, uh, it is it will be located on the family page. So it is under families 2020 2021 family dashboard and then COVID monitoring. So the board can't see the monitor. So oh. Can you email the link just to the board? Or are we not able to click into it? Yes, I will email the link. It just isn't it live yet. The audience can see yeah. it, but the, we but can't. the board okay. can't. We haven't seen the, we haven't okay. seen the data either. So. They haven't seen it. Ah. Uh, because we're missing that big screen that needs to come down. <laughs> okay. Yep, I can do that right now. And I'll try to do the both and. We'll see how talented I am right now. So w nurses are tracking the data and they are inputting the data um, and sending it into, uh, into Mary Hyman. And then it goes to communications every Friday afternoon. So you will see on the page that there is a date. Actually, I wonder, Mary, can you send the link? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, Mary Wody is going to send the link to you. Thank you. So um, at the top of the page, you will see the date that it was last updated. This is Friday's data. So this is from September 10th. It lists the percentage of students fully vaccinated in grades 9, 12, and in grade 6, 8. So right now, or as of last Friday, 
we had 77.17% of our students in ninth through 12th grade vaccinated and 50.41% of our students in grades six through eighth. Now, it's important to remember that in order to be vaccinated, you need to be 12. And I reported at the August 17th meeting that we knew even on March 1st, we would still have well over 200 students who have not, sixth graders who have not turned 12 yet in our middle schools. I also wanna note something that I think is important for us to take pride of. Uh, you also remember that at the time on August 17th, our ninth through 12th grade vaccination fully vac vaccinated rate was 73%. And now we are at 77.17%. And that just shows that our community is continuing to be committed to getting our students uh, vaccinated. And again, strongly recommend because we know that that is the safest. Um, measure uh, in ensuring that our students are not infected and don't get ill. So as we move down on this page, um, we have the total number of employees that we have, 1,200, total number of students um, that we have, um, which is uh, 8,400 at this point. We had, we had closer to 8,500 at the start of the school year. And you'll see under there, there's the confirmed Edina Public Schools employee COVID-19 cases. Now again, this is of September 10th, right? Because it's the Friday, it's always the Friday before. And again, I just wanna put here, you'll always see the date at the top of the page. So new confirmed staff COVID cases this week, which was as of last week, um, there was one case. Total number of staff with confirmed COVID since August 30th, we had two cases, confirmed cases. 8,400 students confirmed Edina Public Schools student COVID-19 cases. Um, we've broken that down by early learning and elementary and then secondary, okay? So uh, the other thing is we wanted to clarify that there's a difference between quarantining and isolating. And so when our students are identified um, as positive for COVID, they are isolated as opposed to just being quarantined. And there is some confusion in the community regarding the number of days that students are at home. And so uh, what I would say is we just aren't able to compare student case to student case. And I know how it is typical to talk to your neighbor and to find out from your neighbor, and it may seem like we're using different days that students are out of school, and it is just case by case basis, and there's a difference between isolation and quarantine. And so I encourage uh, the community to just know that our nurses are working diligently and we want our kids in school. And so we are not going to um, create a situation where our kids are going to be out of school longer than they need to be. So as of uh, September 10th, the total number of confirmed cases that week, uh, early learning and elementary were 15, middle and high school four. The number of students with confirmed COVID cases since August 30th, 26 early learning and elementary, and 10 total for middle and high school. Can I interrupt really fast? Of course. So the 15 is a subset of the 26? Correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you for asking. And then the last area that we have is related to quarantines. And so uh, we'll start on the left-hand side, and that is Edina Public Schools employees who are in quarantine. And this is broken down by quarantines related to close contacts in the school setting or at a school-sponsored activity, and uh, quarantines related to close contacts outside of school, so in a non-school setting. So the number of staff who are in quarantine due to close contact in a school setting uh, as of the 10th 
of September, we were at three. The number of staff in quarantine due to close contact outside of school was at zero. We move on to the right hand side and uh, Edina Public School students who are in quarantine. So the number of students in quarantine as a result of close contact in a school setting or school sponsored activity for early learning and elementary totaled 31. Again, this is of last Friday. For middle and high school, totaled two. The number of students in quarantine due to close contact in a non-school setting, early learning and elementary, 29 students, and middle and high school, three students. So in this particular case, this is not a subset. These are two different sets of numbers. And our bus, our, um, our school buses are considered a school setting? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, I they are. Yep. So, Dr. Stanley, these are. This is a snapshot in time. Th this is as of September 10th. Okay. Thank you. Yep. As of September 10th, and again, these numbers will be updated every Friday. Have you been able to drill in and um, find out for the 31 elementary students? Where during the school day are they, is, are they? Close contact. Yes, thank you. Is a close contact occurring? Is it a lunchtime issue is basically my question. Yeah, we actually have been able to look into that. And I don't know, Jeff, if you want to come up or I can just share, um, as I spoke with Mary, there is not um, evidence that this is happening specifically during lunch. So um, one of the things that we are looking at, I know that principals are just, you know, we're now into, into week two, and it is, we're going to be really specific around the social distancing. We're going to just really shore that up. Um, I don't have the actual numbers for you, and uh, perhaps I could get those from Mary of if we were looking which is related to um, close contacts in a cafeteria setting. I would just be interested in making sure we're continuing to track not just that there's quarantines, but where specifically within the school days are the quarantines happening so then we can on the um, back end figure out what can we do um, better from a mm -hmm. protocol perspective to stop these from happening if we see patterns. Right, and so we are tracking that information okay. and utilizing that information site by site. So for instance, like I said, principals, um, I, was, I was at a school actually presenting uh, last week and um, as part of the principal update, uh, he provided very specific information um, related to making certain that we are shoring up our mitigation efforts. Can I just add two comments? Of course. Um, I just want to say this is extremely helpful. I think it's really smart. I like how it's weekly. I like how it's consistent um, so that expectations from the community um, know where to look for something that it gets updated on Fridays. Um, so I just want to say bravo. It's very easy to follow and very easy to see. Um, and I do think it really does lead to then more information on where close contacts are happening or where blind spots may pop up. I know one of the things last year, I think this is before your time, Dr. Stanley, I can't remember, but I know Randy had gone in and um, with staff and done kind of a dipstick onto like, are we getting, you know, <laughs> is there a point where mask, um, kids aren't wearing masks or whatever it would be. And um, I think that was helpful. I think this goes right into that, into that work. So thank you. This is great. This is great, and I want to thank you for that. Um, but I, I'm just wondering if it's possible also, since we are talking about trends, if you could also provide the board with just put this into a spreadsheet and, and update it every week so we can see all the columns for every week as, as new cases come in. We can see last week we had five cases. This week we have 
10 cases or whatever. Um, it's really hard for me to, to look at this and think, you know, if I get this next week, um, I'll have to pull up two different pages and see uh, um, and compare. It's just, it would be a little easier to read in a spreadsheet form. I'm just wondering, since you're collecting the data anyway. I'd second that, excuse me. Uh, I think it'd be great to have some sort of maybe chart at the bottom of this that shows the trends, cumulative as the weeks go on, how are we doing? Are we trending up? Are we trending down? And something that, I think this is great. Uh, another thing I'd be interested in is a percentage. What percentage of the uh, early learning in elementary school population does this comprise to give us a sense of scale? So those are my two observations. I was just going to echo maybe, you know, you send us your weekly email updates. If this information could just be populated into a Google document that created those graphs for us, I think it could be, if you feel as if you have the resources to do it, it could be automated and then it would be helpful to see that. There's no information that isn't, I mean, I we could also do it ourselves. I'm just going to put that there. I, I'm a firm believer in that, but I do believe that there is benefit in seeing trends as we're making decisions. So so I would suggest if we feel the trend information is valuable that we just provide it to the public on this page and that we get the same information and that it's as simple as providing week of October 10th, this is whatever, and week of October. So it's a build, it's, I think you showed me a similar type of graph. Or it's basically a table, mm -hmm. so you can. Yeah, I just want to make sure that the page stays as clean as possible on the website. So I don't know if there's a way to create a rolling trend. I just want to, but I want to respect and appreciate the intentionality behind keeping the page as simple as possible for the public facing. But I also agree with that it would be information that others might be interested in. So I know I'm not giving you a solution, but I'm saying that I see both sides of it. And I do see benefit, at least at the board level, of seeing trends, especially as we make decisions. So I think trends would be good to see. I don't think I need to see a numerator for the number of students there are. So I don't need the percentages. I think it's denominator. All right. Thank you. Okay, so um, next we're going to move on to where we're at with COVID-19 testing. And I did bring forth the staff resolution for uh, required vaccination or uh, weekly testing uh, at the work session. And I'm wondering if we stop there and see if there were any questions about that or if we're ready to move. I don't think there are questions. I just, for anyone that wasn't able to watch the work session before, um, the a proposal was brought forward to um, have required vaccinations or the option to do weekly testing for um, staff, including um, contractors that interact with students. Um, and the that will be coming forward um, September 28th for a vote. Um, and I believe that's it. But I just wanted to make sure that. Yeah. Um, and I would just like to um, state that earlier this evening, um, the president of EME, Jason Doctor, uh, shared that for that membership, they fully support moving forward with vaccinations or weekly testing. Okay, and then next for student testing, uh, I want to let the public know that we have submitted our orders for our tests. And while I understand that it has been well communicated to the public about 
testing and the supports that we are receiving from uh, the Minnesota Department of Education. We have submitted the order for the test, but the tests have not arrived yet. So it isn't that we are not testing and we have the test kits. We are waiting for them to arrive. And I'm looking over at Jeff. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you want to come up and share some additional information. For Chair Ellenberg, Dr. Stanley, esteemed board members, just uh, it was following up. Mary was not able to make it to tonight's meeting, so I am a poor stand-in. Uh, she is much better looking than I am. Um, so that being said, we just want to do a little bit of update on the, uh, the symptomatic testing that the state is asking us to participate in within each of our districts across the state. Uh, as Dr. Stanley said, the test kits have been ordered. We got that in right away when we first heard that this information was coming out. The state uh, notified us last week that they were, there was a delay in just the supply and demand of the test because the entire country is moving in this direction all at the same time. We did just receive notification today that we're hopefully going to start receiving some of those shipments yet this week. And so with that, we can begin symptomatic testing. And what I want to emphasize with symptomatic testing is, is that largely these tests are designed for students that are exhibiting symptoms at school. So if we see a student that is exhibiting some symptoms at school, when the parents uh, take that student home at night it, or that during that day, that they can be sent home with a test kit and that test kit can be administered within the home environment. We won't be doing any of the testing on site. Um, why wouldn't we be doing the testing on site? In order to conduct testing, there is a specific level of uh, certification that is needed. Uh, I cannot, I do not know what CLIA stands for, but I have talked to Mary about this quite a mm -hmm. bit. Uh, there is a certain level of additional certification to conduct those uh, tests on site that we don't have yet. And so at this point, um, we are moving to send those home with families. They would conduct the tests and then they would bring that information back. I thought I remembered a nurse, one of our nurses coming in specifically asking for these tests. Yes, that was one of our nurses, one of our LSNs uh, that came into one of our previous board meetings talking about that. For, for us, in order for us to go in that direction, we would need to have all of our nursing staff trained up in the CLIA standards. They would have to be they would have to be garbed in full PPE uh, during that time period. So the N95 masks, and they would have to they would have to have the the protection and the gloves and and everything else. There's a certification process just to go through the the, the appropriate fitting of the N95 masks. Uh, just an update on that. We are pursuing that so that we can see whether or not that is something that would be viable for us. But right now we're also running into a supply and demand issue with N95 masks that can be appropriately fitted. Uh, to the faces of our of our teachers, so N95 masks have to be of an appropriate fit. Um, and while N95 masks are now available, they are not available in all necessary sizes for us to be able to get our nurses access to these N95 masks. Can I ask a clarification? So I was under the understanding that we did have a CLIA waiver for these tests. I was told that was part of our testing committee work last year. And um, so I know Mary's not here to answer, but I would like us to go back and look at that and the options because we were able to test on site last year and they were able to actually do diagnostic testing within the nurse's office last year as well. So I guess there's a miss here with why there would be a delay and what something's not, there's, there's a miss somewhere. So if I would... Yeah. I can definitely go back. I know when I spoke with Mary last week, she said that there is additional CLIA waiver certification training that is needed. And I will, I will go back with her and get that inf information why the additional requirement is there. Right, right. And, with the, and, and this is the Bionex. Is that mm -hmm. a test that came from, the, that the government says we have, are they dictating that test? Or we are allowed to do any type of test? Do you know? From my understanding, what she shared with me is that is the best test for symptomatic testing. Okay. 
And to follow up on Julie's questions, um, what's the turnaround on the Binax test? The results come back in how long? 10 minutes. Very fast. Rapid results. Very fast. fast. Yep. Okay. And there's two, t if I, there's two tests in the Bionex, and one is 10 minutes, and the recommendation is then to do it again in another 24 to 36 hours, if I'm not mistaken. That's how it works. And the students confirm that the test has been taken by bringing it in the next day and showing it to the nurse on duty? No, I'm sure it's How's a it verified? Phone call. No, they don't bring it in. It's self-reporting? I don't know how Mary has it set up. I wish Mary was here to share that yeah. information because she knows all of those details. Um, and I can guarantee that we'll, we'll be able to get you that information in the summer. Okay, and then a the following question is, can a family elect to new, use a different test if they wanted to? They have that, if it had, they have it at home? Or... So, so as, as Mary emphasized to me, we've been promoting families to get test kits to have on hand within home since last April. And so the Binax test kits are really supplemental to that. And mm -hmm. so if a student is symptomatic at home and parents want to utilize a test, they can actually utilize the, one of those tests that they've, that hopefully they've had on hand within the home environment. And if not, we can make the accommodation for them to get a, a hold of a Binax test, or they can have a different test taken from their clinician or from down at their clinic. Okay, and will a successful negative result be necessary in order for the student to return to school to attend? If they're yes. symptomatic, yes. Okay, just had to hear yes. that out loud. Yes. And I think we need just some more clarification too, what, what you, Jeff, your answer, um, about the testing that was done at home ahead of time, because my understanding that was for asymptomatic testing. That was done at, that's been the push from the state, like more of like a screening, a surveillance mm -hmm. type testing, which is different. And so I guess I just, I, I'm not, I need a lot more information okay. on how this is gonna work. And to Owen's question, like families should be able to do their own test and what that looks like. We need to give them guidance on that. I'm gonna echo that I feel like there's some holes that we would need filled with information from Mary. Um, I'd like to think that the opportunity to have symptomatic testing in the school is to also help allow us to keep students in school. And so if there is an opportunity for nurses to administer those tests in school, I'd really like to, for us to pursue that. Um, I'd also like to just make sure that we're clear that families, if they are concerned about their student, their symptomatic student, either, I'd like to think we are giving them the opportunity to use other testing options if, if they feel so. Um, if they aren't sure they wanna do, I believe the Binex is antigen and versus PCR. So we're gonna get, make sure we give family those options. And then my next question is, so if kids go home in quarantine, so I'm, I've been exposed because Erica has it, I'm going home, I'm in quarantine, am I being sent home with a test? I would think not. I would think maybe that's, I, I'm trying to understand that too, since that's not a symptomatic, that's a quarantine. Are we? So I would recommend maybe at our 28th meeting that if we could have, similar to the flow chart, like a testing protocol. This is the recommended test. This is when yes. the student will get it. Um, they're going to be testing at home. This is the required yep. um, waiver parent, if it's going to be at school. Yeah, all of these more, the granular, more granular detail. And then if, if there's an exposure, are we going to just some of those, right. some of that FAQ? Mm -hmm. And also we had talked a little bit in the work session about how, so this is symptomatic testing, but also for surveillance testing, if there could be a decision flowchart about that becoming a part of one of our mitigation strategies as well. Because I think when we talk about, you know, different 
circumstances in the community, different levels of transmission in the school, when we have that conversation, we're talking about masking, I agree that testing should go hand in hand with that and that schools around the country, school districts and states are doing surveillance testing and we know what surveillance testing is because we were one of the first to do it. And so I think bringing that in as part of the decision flowchart is gonna be important, especially if we're talking about potentially you know, it, even if taking masks off is, is on the table, that this should also be a part of it. So, uh, I just want to make a suggestion since there are a lot of questions and ideas here, which is that since the board members are currently thinking of it, that everybody who has questions send an email to the superintendent tonight or tomorrow so that all the questions can get chat captured. I saw her writing madly, <laughs> but as just as a practical matter, this is sort of a, a hot area. Everybody mm -hmm. should take it within the next 24 hours, send an email to the superintendent, then we can have that follow up on the 28th and if action is needed before then, at least she has those questions in a handy format. That's that great. would be my suggestion. Thanks, Thank you, Lenny. Okay, then I am going to invite Dr. Smazel and Jody de St. Hubert to come up and talk about um, COVID-19 mitigation updates in particular, uh, what is happening when our students are quarantined and they need to learn from home. Hey, good evening, Chair Allenberg, Dr. Stanley and board members. Um, we, we have highlighted the different quarantine processes for students. Um, when they're individually quarantined and need to be learning at home. Um, the, the one thing that um, we are very proud of is the level of consistency that we've been trying to build around the plan, which is something that we heard in previous board meetings, the importance of that consistency. And the other thing we're proud of is we know that this is a work in progress, right? That we have a plan for now, but that we need to continually be um, assessing and evaluating how that plan is working for students and families and evolving that plan. And so we're at a base level of what the plan looks like right now with the needs that we're currently seeing in quarantine. Um, at our elementary level, um, our students that would go into quarantine would get an email message from their teachers um, right away that has a video describing what, what the resources and supports are in place for those students that are at home in quarantine. Um, they do include some must-do lessons that students should be doing um, when they're at home in quarantine if they're feeling up for it and they are asymptomatic and able to do those lessons. And then there is a plethora of may-do activities as well. So there's additional resources that will be provided. Um, in addition to that, we are committing to two times a week check-ins um, with the students. And that check-in might be um, a variety of different people based on the resources and needs in the, in the building in that classroom at that time. Um, in addition to that, um, we really want to emphasize how when the student returns to school after however long that time needs to be, that the teacher is 100% committed to team on seeing where that student is at academically on the materials that they missed but were engaging in as they could in, in that assessment, then making sure that they get caught up. Um, I would liken that to like if a student is out with the flu or if a student is out on a vacation. Teachers um, are really committed to that. Okay, we have the student back in our space. We need to see where they are in terms of the material they missed and really support them in person at this time. Um, the secondary is also teaming very closely together as a secondary team, both at the middle schools and the high school. Um, and they are communicating also together that um, things will need to adjust and change um, based on what we see going forward. Um, they have communicated in a variety of different places that for extended absences that may or must occur, that they will provide materials for students, um, either asynchronously or synchronously through the Schoology um, website, and that does, or the Schoology resource, and that does bring me back to elementary two. We are continuing to encourage families to be accessing Seesaw and Schoology and accessing the lessons that are there for the students. Um, and there is specific communication about students reaching out to teachers when at any time they need help um, with the resources and materials that they're accessing at the secondary during that time.
before we move on to um, information about lunches and cafeterias, are there any questions? You mentioned asynchronous and synchronous, and I was under impre the impression that we were going to be all in person and that there wasn't going to, uh, that we were not going to do dual modality this year in our teaching delivery. I was wondering if that's, if I have that wrong or? Yeah, so, the, the, so, so this is specific to the secondary where that communication is given. Right now at the elementary, we are not providing the live streaming or the synchronous. So at the secondary, it is going to be very much based on individual situations. Mostly will be um, the asynchronous lessons. There might be an unusual situation where it needs to be synchronous. Um, for example, maybe a special education student on a unique IEP where that might need to happen. And so that has been um, communication among the administration team that, that that might be an option at certain times. But in any event, I mean, right now, if you're signed up for EVA courses, you're having EVA courses, but when you have not signed up for EVA courses, and you're not um, a special needs student with an IEP that might need this, mm -hmm. are students getting um, remote delivery? Right now they are not, yet the communication is that it could be in the future. So this was on the, the communication that Principal Beaton shared. Mm, with, I'm not on his email. So. Yeah, so with the high school um, parents, and so it's communication with them. And that is specific to the individual situations that the students are involved in. Right now they are not providing that. However, it could be in rare situations. So I don't get this flipped around. The we will be doing some level of remote learning at the elementary or at the secondary. I, no, no. Nope. The elementary is a hundred percent no live streaming, asynchronous lessons that families need to access for, through through Schoology or Seesaw. Okay. So yes. it's the secondary that we may have some remote. There is yes possibilities. Of okay, so we're exploring this. We've not made commitments to it yet. Right. That's a oh. good way of saying it. Owen. Thank okay. You. Mm -hmm. And you clarified it's for students that have unique learning needs. In those rare situations that might be occurring. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say thank you for acknowledging that it's a work in progress and that you're continuing to evolve it into what works best for our students. So I, I want to say that I appreciate that and recognize that work. I also wanted to say that as a, a parent, I witnessed a back to school night for one of the middle schools last week mm -hmm. and was amazed at the consistency that is, um, that is happening across all teachers in having options for kids when they, if they are home. Mm -hmm. And the fact that lessons still continue to be online in Schoology pages and that the work that's being done by our teachers to have that as an option if kids unfortunately are home. Um, I just wanted to recognize that work to you so you know that, that it was very much appreciated by myself and a lot of other families. So I have um, two comments or questions. One is um, I want to know if as an administrative team or elementary school administrative team, are we going to be um, tracking students out of multiple quarantines because I think that um, obviously that mm -hmm. there'll be a greater impact to learning and mm -hmm. mental health if quarantines stack on top of quarantines mm -hmm. and we might have to come up with a different approach mm -hmm. to students that um, for some reason or another miss um, more than I mean quite frankly, if it's more than one quarantine, right. that's a month of school that mm -hmm. a kid's missed, yeah. um, that we need to come up with a different approach. Um, the second thing is, um, I really want, I mean, we can't always have real-time feedback unless you want beepers like I used to have in the 90s when I worked in um, an agency in Chicago. But um, I really want to know if you guys feel that you need more resources to reach our students 
in the at the elementary level that are being quarantined um, because I think that um, I think that we knew about the Delta variant over the summer, but the reality is that um, from a resource perspective, we don't have the same resources that we did from a financial perspective that we did last year. Um, so if you guys see, even within two weeks or three weeks, and you, Dr. Stanley, that we really need to ramp up mm -hmm. to give these kids a more enhanced learning experience when they're on quarantine, mm -hmm. let us know because that's a board decision that we need to make from a prioritization of resource perspective. But I'd rather, rather have that conversation sooner than later. Um, mm -hmm. And so if we start seeing larger number of kids quarantined or um, if there's something um, that we can do creatively with um, the EVA system, I don't, I don't know. And I don't wanna just throw stuff out that people are gonna freak out about. But uh, that, I guess that's my main sentiment is please come to us um, as soon as possible that you think, wow, we really need to ramp up something mm -hmm. to offer these kids more. I think I echo that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Dr. Smazel, do you want to talk about the efforts that we have uh, in the cafeteria? Sure. Uh, thank you, and uh, good to see you again. Um, we have... Um, uh, Mr. Eric Hamilton and I have walked a number of cafeterias, in particular at the elementary level. And one of the things that we discussed is the the way in which we're able to move air and exchange the air in the cafeteria. So we've maxed out the air exchange system. And in many cases, it's exchanging that air six or seven times per hour. So that's a significant amount of air that we're moving and exhausting out of those rooms. And again, trying to keep the freshest air possible in that space. In addition to that, we've also ordered um, HEPA filters, uh, three per cafeteria in the K-8 system. And those provide just another layer of filtration uh, with the air that is in that space. Uh, when we talked about lunches this fall with the principals, one of our criteria was let's try to get kids to the biggest space we can. Let's try and spread them out as far as we can because uh, we need distance between them when we're trying to mask. And um, putting kids in the cafeterias actually creates, in most cases, the greatest amount of space uh, as compared to the classrooms. Um, that's not necessarily true in some of our kindergarten classrooms. So we've kind of went back to kindergarten, some kindergarten students eating in the classroom because those kindergarten rooms in some cases are very, very large. So it does give us an opportunity to spread kids out as well. Uh, the other thing that uh, we wanted to make sure is that kids mask on the way in and they mask on the way out and we're tight around those protocols. And then uh, we have continued to expand the way that we can use the outdoors. We've had a beautiful fall so far this year. Uh, I will say uh, probably 100% of the Highland students eat outside every day. Um, when I went down to Normandale, about two thirds of the students were eating outside. I was over to Concord this last week and they just kicked off their outdoor lunch program and had a significant number of students eating outside. And all of our elementaries are now doing that in one way, shape, or form. So if we can um, encourage kids and support them, either through volunteers or other staff, in supervision with them eating outdoors, it just provides yet another layer that we can address. And then we've also uh, talked to some of the administrators about the idea of breaking the lunches into shifts between recess and lunch so that we can have the number of students that go in there. And those would be those would be strategies that we would employ on days where we can't leverage the great outdoors like the uh, rainy days and things like that and just try to navigate those lunch shifts by breaking students into smaller groups to be able to do that. Um, also at the secondary levels, trying to use multiple spaces for lunches has been important. Uh, we have multiple spaces at Southview, multiple spaces at Valley View and the high school. Many cases we're continuing to leverage the gyms, which makes it difficult for some of the teachers 
who uh, teach physical education and health to be able to access those spaces, but we're continuing to work through alternatives to that and really just trying to, uh, again, keep kids safe when they're um, eating the food they need to uh, rejuvenate for learning. Okay, so that concludes the COVID mitigation updates and any additional questions? Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, so uh, thank you for, um, this, this is new this year, the um, ability to eat outdoors at lunchtime at every building. I think that that's very important, um, a, an extremely important aspect. I know that weather is going to turn cold, mm -hmm. and um, I'm just... I'm listening to um, how we're approaching this, and I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to, you know, when uh, one of the things that the uh, C uh, Center for Disease Control states is that, you know, when you are um, not able to provide one layer of mitigation, then maybe there would be others. So I, I, I was wondering to talk a little bit more about cohorting um, in order to prevent spread during lunch. And I, mm -hmm. I know that we've talked a little bit about it, yeah. but um, I'm, I just wanted to make sure I understood the, the thinking behind having kids going to the cafeteria where they're not truly in cohorts, um, and they're without masks. Yeah, so we still leverage that to some degree. So even in the cafeteria, we have certain classes that sit in certain spaces. When kids eat outside, they eat with their class. They're not eating with the other classes, they're eating with their class. So we're still trying to leverage that cohorting concept whenever possible. I, I st I'm going to be interested in hearing follow-up um, at, at the next meeting on how we're ha going to be handling winter time um, mm -hmm. with a, with lunch time, and um, the other thing that I'm I'm wondering about and I haven't heard um, is that I do know that with after school you know before school after school activities um, that is another time where. Um, where we are definitely mixing cohorts. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering uh, what the school policy is on testing or additional, you know, other schools are doing additional testing for students in activities, in after school activities. And um, I'm, I'm just wondering where we stand on that. Yeah, I don't know if I can really speak to that at this point. I don't know, Stacy or Val, if you have anything else to add about um, additional testing for before school or after school activities or any yeah. other layers of mitigation on that. Now, right now, the testing that we have in place, and Val, please do come up. Um, the testing as we move forward right now will be the symptomatic testing. We have not added for athletics activities or before and after school additional testing. Um, Val, do you want to talk about the mitigation efforts and things like that that are happening in before and after school programming? Sure. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Stanley and members of the board. Um, we're continuing to follow the protocols we did last year. Um, our staff is meeting regularly with our um, school principal and teachers. So if there's anything from the school day that we need to know, then we follow up with the family um, alongside the principal. So the same exact protocols are happening after school that are happening during the day. We have families of students. Um, it is not... An, uh, it is not um, strict cohorting, so there is mixing. But at this point, um, as in summer, we have, excuse me, we have not had transmissions that have come out of an after-school setting. Um, I think there are different strategies that are being used um, through the Minnesota State High School League. 
there's a whole nother set of strategies. So I think that Troy would be better to speak to that, but I think they're also on our, on our pages um, in terms of what is uh, available for families. And my, yeah, I think that's all I can speak to. Questions on that? Yeah, no, I, thank you. Um, so I, I, I appreciate that. And at our next meeting, I'm hoping that, that we are continuing to look at the CDC recommendations. And, and part of that is that for those times, for after school activities, there's an additional layer of a level of mitigation. And I, I just want to make sure that we're, we are paying attention to that because um, it, it is, uh, research is showing that yeah. a, those after school activities are, are, are primary sources for spread in the community. Just so you know too, the students are, are following all masking protocols inside activities and again mirroring the school day in terms of that. So, um, yeah. thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Can I just add anecdotally really quickly that um, having a student in a fall sport, communication from the coaches has been outstanding um, with explaining the implications of masking inside and with different activities. Um, if they're inside going into Cheetah to get wrapped, they are masked. I mean, it's been very clear that the goal is to keep the kids playing and to keep the kids sports. So I just wanted to add that in because I have found in my experience this fall with a student athlete, it has been nothing short of um, just excellent. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, two comments really fast. Um, for lunchtime, um, I would love to see like very specific expectations that say, um, like I think it's great that Cornelia is 100% outside, but I would love to see sort of a threshold that says our expectation is as, as a district is that no more than however many, I guess it would have to be based on square footage, but capacity. no more than X percent of kids per capacity can be in a room during lunchtime having lunch. Um, and very specific thresholds for our expectations for lunchtime. And I have two rationales for that. One is because um, we can't, if we don't set district-wide expectations, it's hard for us to monitor what's happening in every single classroom at lunchtime. Um, but then I know that I don't want there, I also don't want there to be inequities in across schools based on what schools can get the most volunteers. And I think it's wonderful that we have wonderful volunteers at certain schools, but I think doing something like that would, will sort of force us as a district to see where we might have to actually build in resources to help um, all of our schools have the expectation that we have dis district wide for the optimal lunchtime environment as opposed to, and on a consistent basis, as opposed to having it um, be so dependent on volunteers. Because I do think you will see a, a variance in the ability of schools to um, be able to bring in volunteers for lunchtime activities. That's all I have. Okay, any additional questions? I um, captured that information, athletics and activities, look at testing the next time that we come back, um, specifically for lunchtime, um, really put together a protocol based on square footage, what percentage of kids would be in or out, and then really looking at that through the lens of equity to ensure uh, that students, regardless of the school that they attend, will be able to have access to lunch outdoors or any, whatever we determine is um, the safest environment that is not dependent on access to a volunteer. If it is, great, but if it's not, what do we do then as a district? And, and maybe you can come back with, a, I, I am not clear on what the policy is for our um, events. Are you referring to testing or? I'm referring to like football, soccer, 
Um, yeah, so in, in the return to school mm -hmm. plan, it's outlined around masking and that, so I just want to make sure if you're looking yeah, for yeah. something in addition to this. So it's outlined that when students are um, uh, not having physical exertion, they will always have their masks on, whether it is practice or whether it is um, during a game. Are you right. looking for no, something in addition I'm to that? I'm thinking of spectators. Oh, okay. Is it? Mm -hmm. And volu volunteers yeah. are in there too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you mm -hmm. all for the updates and the work you've done so far this year. Okay. Okay, we're going to move on to policy review, and I'll turn it over to Director Michelson. Thank you, Chair Allenberg. We have two policies for discussion today 627 and, five and 912. Um, 627, let me get organized here. Educational programs, fine arts, athletics, and activities participating in, uh, participation in academic eligibility. Um, we, um, heard from Troy Stein on this with the SEEK committee's, um, impact, uh, uh, uh observations, and it has, um, a lot to do with the breakdown and making a distinction between Minnesota High School League and non-Minnesota High School League. And um, and Nikki Tusher is right here to offer some color commentary on, uh, on why we did this. So, Nikki. And so this is a part of a trifecta of policies. And so this one is about participation and academic eligibility. And I think that's a grounding point um, for the board to hear because there, different policies do different things. And this one's to convey to um, our participants what those eligibility components are. So it's not the activities funding one or it's not, um, so it's, it's not those two policies. So a couple points that I just want to, changes that I want to point out because you do see a lot of red lines within this policy. One is, the first one is, we eliminated the definitions because we were getting stuck on the definitions as a policy committee on what is an activity, what isn't an activity, what is a club, and that's not really the purpose of this policy. The purpose, purpose of this policy is to talk about eligibility. So then you'll see the new section three talks about the Minnesota State High School League sponsors activities. It talks about the eligibility violations and penalties. It defers to the Minnesota State High School League, but then on top of it, it talks about things that we require as a district. And so that's one of the changes is it got rid of all of the violations, but instead of referring to the Minnesota State High School League um, and then just the district on the, the additional um, consequences um, on the district behalf, which is really that um, um, element of service back to the community, and that's what you'll see in the first one. Um, similarly, you have section three, and then you have section four. Section four does the same type of thing, but for non-Minnesota High School League rules. Um, it also talks about one of the most important things that we heard from Troy and the SAC committee was around the curricular component. They wanted to make sure that students didn't have a curricular um, penalty, like if you were participating in a um, theater production or as part of a class or a uh, uh, performance of some sort that you didn't miss those performances. And so that's now embedded in our policy. Um, and then I think there's one other change that I thought we'd point out and that's, um, it goes all the way back down to um, section eight. And in section eight, you'll see some changes around improvement plans for GPA components of things. And the changes in that one now comport with what we're actually doing to help students who, who may be um, in that academic component where they need additional uh, um, guidance. And so that improvement plan component. And so those are the four major changes within the policy. Director Michelson, is there anything else you'd like me to highlight? I think you pretty thoroughly described it all. Any questions? No? Okay. I think we can then move on to policy 912, which deals with community relations, and we are recommending that we rescind because uh, this is redundant, and uh, perhaps you could take it from here, Nikki. Sure. Um, one of the reasons the policy committee talked about rescinding this is it was created at a time where we as a district needed to, def to define our 
our partnerships and what those look like. We now have contracts and other mechanisms that defines those partnerships, and so this is something that's just no longer lead, needed, and that's why we talked about rescinding it. So what do you mean by we have contracts that define it? Because this was adopted as an effort to spur the creation of more partnerships. So when we enter into something like um, some partnerships with other districts, for example, it's, it's one that I w was brought to my attention. I'm actually going to look over at Val a little bit too since I've only been here for this last time for a year and a half. But there, the contract itself actually talks about if we can share data and things like that back and forth between some of the organizations that we're working with versus this policy itself had a data practices component of things. And we'd rather spell that out with the relationship with the entity versus in this policy itself. When we reviewed it, Lonnie, as a committee, no one could understand a lot of the verbiage. And we figured if all every single person on the committee was confused about what was the point between this, and then we were like, well, would Ed Fund be considered part of this or sort of a different policy? Then we were wondering why do we have this since it doesn't seem to actually be doing anything right now. I think that the goal was to try to spur the creation of partnerships. That was the objective. If it didn't accomplish it, then so be it. I don't think that this policy, I think if we want to create partnerships, I think it belongs in the strategic plan, not in policy. And I, so. Which it is in the strategic plan. Yeah. And it is also in Dr. Stanley's board goals, or superintendent goals, too. And working toward policy minimalism, if it's not necessary, why keep it? So currently, if um, I, I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm looking at, at what was deleted. And one, one of the things that was deleted was the school board will approve all formal partnerships with memberships, joint agreements, contracts, and service agreements. These partnerships must be documented in writing in accordance with this policy and its appendices. Uh, contracting authority resides solely with the school board. So I, I'm just wondering, when we take that out, is there another, um, how does, is there another policy that speaks to what's being taken out or are we now um, are, is the administration now able to um, create partnerships without approval of the school board? And it depends on what type of policy or what type of partnership you're looking for. And so you have vendors, which we do have a, a, in the 700 series, we have contracts that are approved by the board for those vendor relationships. And so then you have partnerships that you might develop where you want to share information back and forth and those would be something that would, would come to this group to be approved as a contract and so there's only very few and I, I don't have it off the top of my head but there are very few binding components on director uh, superintendent stanley um, uh, director tope and the board itself are the contracting entities for the district in my recollection and so those are the people who can bind the district to um, a contract yeah, and I'm thinking of, for example, at the high school, um, we create um, the district created a partnership with a Korean school, and that had to come before the board. And I'm just wondering, if we get rid of this, is it is does that need is is that the type of thing that could be approved just at the high school level? That's an interesting question. Um, I'd have to know what the what the partnership with the, with um, the Korean school entailed and what that what that meant. And so, depending on you know if it's an affiliation where it's just a friendly affiliation, that's one thing. But if there's information sharing or resource sharing, then that's when it that's when the full board um, itself would get involved. Is that those types of things where you're committing some type of an obligation to uh, a, an external entity, that's, that's where Dr. Stanley or the board itself would be 
um, part of that conversation. If it's a loose affiliation, meaning um, we're we're going to talk about we're going we're we're partnering with this entity to you know share ideas um, just on how to become a better school. That those are those are often casual conversations. So it depends on what the partnership it entails. And I'm not familiar enough with that the partnership that you speak of to know um, what that partnership entailed. I was going to um, thank you very much for that, Dr. Tischer. I was going to say, you know, if if it required any form of in-kind donation partnership or financial partnership, my recollection of this policy was it was anything that was ten thousand dollars or greater mm -hmm. right. um, in relationship to that policy. And so, um, as we were reviewing it. It seemed like maybe it was something at that time that was necessary. <laughs> and because we have uh, many different, as Dr. Trisha said, uh, we have 700 series of policies that are really going to put in um, a system of checks and balances to make certain that we, you know, do not have um, an, an administrator or an individual going out and creating these um, partnerships that would require financial um, commitments uh, that the in the district that we weren't prepared to right. handle right and I'm I'm not even as you know I, I appreciate we would definitely for financial commitments we would definitely I would expect that we would have a policy covering that but I don't know and that's why I'm just asking I just don't know I don't know our policies well enough to say it, it when we are creating partnerships, is there some board oversight? And I, I just would, I would request that. that yeah, I would. I echo that. I think just turning it, since this is just discussion, but turning that over to Director Michelson to say, when this gets brought again for a vote, that you've thoroughly vetted that this isn't a layer of a check and balance that we're removing. So I think I think that makes total sense, Ellen. In that vein. Uh, Lenny, since you were here when this was drafted and accepted, <laughs> being the, the voice of the, the historical voice of institutional memory, do you have a recollection as to uh, some of the, the, the trade-offs and, and what Janie just brought up? So other than this policy was a, adopted as a mechanism to look for new partnerships and then create a structure by which new partnerships could be entered into. So that rather than have a policy unwritten that says go search out partnerships, the goal was to have a policy written that says go search out partnerships, but here are the parameters. And you'll see that um, there was supposed to be a framework for creating formal partnerships that's listed in here. So it, it was to try to expand resources outside the district that we might be able to utilize in being innovative in uh, expanding our reach but so it's it's doing been so with guard guardrails okay so it's been five years since it came into being has it fallen short of its goals has it lived up to it so I think that we could do a better job of forming partnerships and taking advantage of resources, and we've talked about that for a number of years, and in fact, that's why it's in the strategic plan. So I think the strategic plan has revisited the concepts underlying this policy. And so then the policy, again, was to say, what are the guardrails that exist as you engage in the activities that we have listed as a focus in the STRAT plan? Is the language in the STRAT plan strong enough to um hold the objectives and purposes that this policy was created um, so to I, serve? I think Ellen and Janie's feedback was good that the policy committee should make sure that the, the intent or the check and balance of making sure the board has oversight over um, partnerships, we just need to make sure that that is not lost in policy. And if it is, we either add it to a different policy or retain that aspect of it. So I would recommend that we bring it back to yeah, policy. Yeah, and just for that aspect and make sure. Okay. That part. Let's do that then. Yeah. 
All right, so that concludes our two policies that were under review. Thank you, Nikki, for coming up. Thank you. Uh, John Tope, Director of Business Services. Um, do I have a motion to um, approve the proposed property tax levy pay 21? So moved. Second. Good evening, Director Tope. Good evening, Chair Allenberg, Superintendent Stanley, and members of the board. Uh, tonight we begin the process of certi certifying our property tax levy for pay 22, which will cover our fiscal year 22-23. Your uh, report starts on page 210. Uh, we have received three reports from the state, three levy reports from the state. You have the first one in your packet. It does not really represent uh, a, a proper certification of the levy um, because there's some items that are missing from there. And so on page 211, if you want to scroll to that, I put some items in uh, gold. Uh, and those are the market value referendum right at the top. That amount is going to be going down slightly. Uh, we have uh, ADM estimates that we have to have corrected by the Department of Education. A little further down, the alternative facilities, long-term facilities maintenance levy. I've actually put the number in there that I think we're going to be very close to uh, because that wasn't in that first levy report that is in your packet. Reemployment insurance right underneath that is going to go down significantly by about $233,000. And then if you scroll to the next page, you'll see uh, debt service. Get there. Uh, our debt service will be going up slightly uh, based on uh, the next agenda item. So with those estimates, uh, it looked uh, to be around a 3% increase from the prior year. So very reasonable increase, even with the approval of the increase in the capital projects levy, which our voters approved on May 11th, and the $7 million bond issue. Uh, we usually have a recommendation uh, that you approve it at its maximum, and certainly tonight, with the way the levy reports are running from MD, I would uh, definitely recommend that. So traditionally, we do actually approve the maximum, and then we adjust it as we learn more during the rest of the year. So I would definitely be in favor of what you're recommending. And even at the maximum, the 3% kind of falls <clears throat> below a number of the prior years. Anything else? Mm -hmm. I agree. We'll now vote to approve the general, oops, did I move on to the next, sorry. Yes, we'll now vote to approve the 21 um, pay 22 property tax levy. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Um, the tax levy is approved. Thank you, Director Tope. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the General Obligation School Building Bond Series 2021B? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for staying so late. I know you're. I know you're used to being here. It's all good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we had a uh, bond uh, bid uh, on September 8th, wasn't it, Jody? September 8th, that's September correct. 8th, and we had five bidders. Uh, I'll let Jody bring you all the good news. All right, so if you will look at the results page, which is the first page of the report, you'll see that we did receive five bids. And um, above that, you'll notice that the underlying rating of the district was affirmed at AAA, which is the highest rating that Moody's assigns. You, along with two other districts in the state of Minnesota, are the only districts that have that rating. So it's Edina, Minnetonka, and Wyzetta that have the AAA rating from Moody's. So I should um, recognize John for his work in preparing for that rating call and representing your district so well. Very helpful to the process. They ask lots of questions. He's kind of on the hot seat for a while, and so he did a really, really nice job of of um, assuring that you uh, maintain that rating and making the um, rating agency confident in what's happening here in Edina Public Schools. So that was, that was really great to have his um, effort um, and uh, we appreciate that very much. 
So you'll see that the low bidder was Hilltop Securities out of Dallas. They have been bidding more regularly and finally won. So it was great to see that. They have a, an office now in St. Paul, and so I think they've got a bigger presence here. Um, the low bid was at a 1.63, basically. The high bid at a 1.91. And you'll see that in the notes there, we um, were estimating 1.8% in the pre-sale report that my colleague Matthew Hammer presented to you um, in August. So um, that is uh, good news to see it lower. And in the, you'll see that the treasurer and John already signed off on the proposal form and locked you into that nice low rate. And um, that was lower than the, the um, interest rate that we had in the parameters resolution, which I think we had set at 2.3%. Mm -hmm. So we were well below that and below the pre-sale estimate. So all that turned out great. You'll see the attachments included to the, pre to the sale day report. The bid tab is first with the five bids that you received from Hilltop out of Dallas, Texas, as I mentioned. Piper Sandler, I'm sure, was very disappointed. They were very close behind Hilltop, and they're local here in Minneapolis. Baird out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, and then a couple of New York firms. So great to see that much interest in your bonds. And then the remaining pages are financial schedules, or the next few pages, I should say, are financial schedules just updated as compared to the pre-sale estimates that we provided. So exact same schedules. And then finally, the rating report, which starts on attachments page six and gives the background and rationale for Moody's um, affirming your AAA underlying rating as well as assigning the credit enhanced AA2 rating. So that is everything, all great news, and the tax impact will be um, less with the two questions than what we had uh, communicated during the election. So I think on a $600,000 home, we were expecting about $34, if I remember correctly, and I think we're at like 23 now. Um, you've got a little bit of an increase in your tax base, and with this nice low rate, everything has come together well, and so it'll be a little less than what taxpayers might be expecting for taxes payable in 22 once the levy gets levy reports gets updated and finalized great great news awesome. yeah thank you you're welcome so yeah. now tonight technically we are ratifying the approval we are not approving it but we're simply ratifying the approval that was engaged that was done by the treasurer and john that's correct you authorize them to uh, right. approve the bond sale and sign off on the proposal form should it meet the parameters which it did and so, yes, tonight is a, your action is ratifying that yep. award. Just wanted to clarify, that's all. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will now vote to approve the General Obligation School Building Bond Series 2021B. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the bonds are approved. Thank Great. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank, Thank you all for your hard work. I appreciate the opportunity to be of service of you once again. It's always wonderful working with you and with John, of course. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, John, for Thanks, your hard Jody. work. Do I have a motion to approve the 2021-2022 board goals? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Great. Um, so a draft of these board goals was presented and discussed at the board retreat on August 28th, and board member and superintendent feedback was solicited and integrated into this new version of the board goals. Um, these goals have been reviewed for alignment with super superintendent Stacy's goals. Um, I'm working on a calendar um, of proposed board meetings that Superintendent Stacy and I have been working on. Superintendent Stanley, I apologize. This is always the time of the night when I start making mistakes in the board meeting. So, um, um, so I'm going to provide an overview of um, the board meetings that align with our board goals at the September 28th board meeting. Um, and so I'll just open it up to questions or feedback before we vote on the board goals um, I'll go I was hoping that we could um, and I apologize that this wasn't something that I got in earlier um, I was hoping that we could beef up our board communications and engagement item to include instead of engagement instead of it saying revisit board communications and engagement requirements um, I thought we could use a more open word, um, like procedures or opportunities, and I'm not sure if the board would be interested in, or if this would be the place where we would list out some of those opportunities, or if we just left it in general as more procedures and opportunities. 
I like I th the change of requirements to opportunities. Okay. Does anybody have other feelings on that? No, I had a similar comment um, about, um, and I like the word consistency. So mm -hmm. I think we talked about that at the board retreat too. Like, and I don't think we go into any more detail because really the whole point to revisit is the goal Correct. is to revisit it. But like, just the consistency and, um, and I think it also talks about um, or brings in community feedback, which we've talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the best. I would add in community feedback too there, revisit board communication, engagement, and consistency with opportunities. Um, so I maybe would, revisit. I'm confused. I'll, I'll, I think I follow. Revisit board communications and engagement opportunities with an eye towards consistency. And community feedback. And community feedback. And I that community feedback piece, I thought when we had, we had talked about that at the board retreat was um, when Dr. Stanley had done the thought exchange. Like it was a new way of thinking of things. So it's not necessarily changing any of it, but just looking at how we take feedback, um, just revisiting it. It's not necessarily to change anything. Sorry, I have a proposed change that says revisit board communications and engagement opportunities within an eye towards consistency and community feedback. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have an issue with that? No? Okay. Any, any other comments or questions? I love the calendar matching up with the board. Thank you for doing that work because that will be great. Okay, um, we'll now move to vote. Um, all those in favor of approving the 2021-2022 board goals say aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed? Aye. The board goals are approved. Do I have a motion to approve the 2021-2022 superintendent goals? So move. Is there a second? Second. Uh, these were also discussed at the board retreat um, with some changes made, and then we had a discussion um, in the work session, and um, I guess we can just start off where... <laughs> well, I think, Dr. Stanley, you took some notes on some verbiage changes that you were accepting of. I don't yep. know if you want to just go through those as friendly amendments before we vote. Absolutely. So under the magnet schools, uh, to add a bullet point that would say with an intentional focus on pre-K five through, I'm sorry, pre-K through fifth grade in the fall of 2022, um, that was related to the discussion of currently it shows um, the interconnections between early learning and uh, fluid all the way through 12th grade and um, adding that bullet point would allow for the specificity that we are initially focusing on uh, early learning through fifth grade uh, for the launch in fall of 2022. And then uh, under super tra superintendent transition and onboarding that I would create a bullet point there regarding developing and finalizing uh, metrics to monitor the uh, proficiency levels for our students. Are there further comments or questions about the um, superintendent goals? So, um, and I had emailed Dr. Stanley about this. In terms of onboarding new candidates, there's currently a plan to have a, a instructional session for school board candidates, but I, th I think that it would be prudent in November and December post-election to have orientation programs for the new newly elected members uh, yeah. kind of run by each of the mm -hmm. different departments. Mm -hmm. Yes, and as I look at the leadership development, which is strategy D, it would make sense that that would fall right under there. I'm not following, but... Um, right here. Under 
So the only comment I have is that um, I think these are fairly aggressive goals. And um, I want you to come back to us if you feel that you need, uh, it's similar to the comment I made earlier, if you need support from a resource perspective or a reprioritization perspective, um, that you feel that something's not going to get it done, what do I need to do? Um, because we really, you're amazing and we don't want you to burn out. <laughs> So please communicate openly with us about your progress towards these goals and if there's anything more we can do to support you from a board perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I believe we talked at the retreat about providing um, maybe an every other month update to the governance board. And don't be afraid to move a date later on. I mean, things don't always work exactly as we planned. Mm -hmm. I'd like an update, not just people on the governance, not just the governance board. Right. I, I mean, if you wanted to um, give feedback originally to the governance board and then have that brought to the full board, but um, the best way that this this board functions is when we all hear hear the same information. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, we'll now vote to approve the 2021-2022 superintendent goals. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The superintendent goals are approved. We'll now move on to policy. Um, do I have a motion to approve policies 629 and 913? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Excellent. I'll turn it back over to you, Director Michelson. We have two policies for action tonight, 629 student fundraising and 913 partnerships with parent organizations and booster clubs. And do I invite any discussion we might have on this? There's no changes since we discussed it last No changes. Month, right? Okay. No changes. So, Director Allenberg, I think we can vote on it. Oh, we have to go through nine. Are there any questions on 913? No? Okay. Um, we will now vote to approve policies 629 and 913. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Um, policies 629 and 913 are approved. Um, we, do we have any um, leadership or committee updates? Yes. Okay. Oh. Hang on just one second. I have to pull it up. I have an update from our Ed Fund. Hang on. So it's some exciting news. I'm just going to Read. This is on behalf of um, the Ed Fund and their um, the Heal Together mental health campaign. So last Thursday evening, the Edina City Council approved their first of two rounds of funding through the American Relief Plan Act, ARPA. The city of Edina was allocated $4.9 million in federal funds through ARPA and will begin distributing approved funds and implementing programs in fall of 2021. We um, the Ed Fund is pleased to tell the community that the Ed Fund has received $142,000 towards the Heal Together mental health campaign. This grant allows our schools to increase the number of school-based mental health providers, provide district-wide staffing, assist families through the summer, offer um, benevolence funding, and boost community education. Funding will meet our anticipated programming needs through the 2021-2022 school year. Um, and though we know our work, this is from the Ed Fund, though we know our work is in the area of mental health and wellness is ongoing and forever evolving, this grant provides much needed funds and alleviates some of the burden on Edina Public Schools family. So a big thank you from the Ed Fund that have contributed to this initiative. And if anyone listening would like to hear more about the Heal Together campaign and support this on ongoing work, please visit edinaedfund.org. So excellent work. Um, I'm looking over, I know Jeff Jorgensen has been a huge part of that. 
Dr. Stanley and um, the uh, leaders of the Ed Fund. So thank you, and thanks to the community for that. And thank you, city. Yeah, thank you for the city, to the city of Edina for your partnership in supporting our schools. Um, I just really quickly wanted to recognize Ann Noss, who is our new administrative assistant to the board and superintendent, and you've just been doing a rock star job. So I know you're new to the district, so I wanted to welcome you. So thank you and welcome. Yay. Thank you, Ann. Are there any superintendent updates other than all the ones you gave during the board meeting? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do have some updates. And I had just a fantastic weekend. My Friday started, or ended, my weekend started with the football game. And it was fantastic to be out there uh, seeing the students just spending time together and families just really excited to be there together and our amazing band i they were just phenomenal their precision just left me in awe um and then on saturday i got to participate in the 9 11 uh, recognition ceremony that was held at Utley park and again our band students brought uh, the attendees to tears. They played taps and then they played an amazing, uh, just moving rendition um, of Amazing Grace. And so um, that was really exciting. And then I got to end my weekend <laughs> at the Human Rights and Relations Commission, uh, really listening to our community members, um, really listening to our students who came to speak. Um, which was pretty amazing, and I was grateful for having the opportunity to speak on behalf of the district. So uh, it, some great things are happening in Edina, and I am incredibly uh, proud uh, to be here. I want to send a tremendous thank you and shout out to all of the volunteers who are helping with lunch outdoors. There is absolutely no way that we could have lunch outdoors without the volunteers. And as I went out and about to schools, I met grandmas and I met grandpas and moms and dads and even aunts who are there helping to make certain that our kids can um, be outdoors eating as safe as possible. And then um, I, I do want to share that I was made aware that um, some erroneous information was released this week regarding our MCA scores. And I really want to thank OLG for the partnership and the immediate correcting of the data. They, I was able to connect with their headmaster. Um, she, she explained that the data that was released was actually state scores and not Edina scores. Um, the Edina scores are correct out there on the Minnesota Department of Education website. The wrong scores were just pulled. And so I want to thank them for that partnership and correcting that information and sending that out right away. We appreciate uh, just their relationship and partnership. And then I, I really want to say that it is important for our community to understand that our reading scores stood firmly in a space where we were in public schools that we were in and out of different models, instructional models last year. And our scores were very strong, as strong in some cases. And we had 1,200 less students complete the MCA test last year. And these were some of our most highest performing students in 2019. So we can only imagine how well overall our students would have performed on the MCAs this year. And then I think it is really, I, I would be remiss if I didn't state that we had 1,400 less students complete the MCAs. And again, those students, when we looked at their scores from 2019, they were some of the strongest performing students. So I appreciate that uh, the Minnesota Department of Education said, you know, take this uh, data with a grain of salt. I want to say that 
Our teachers did an amazing job. Our families did an amazing job. And I am incredibly proud of the performance of our students. And again, thank you very much to OLG for immediately uh, sending out information to correct that, um, that misinformation. And then uh, finally, I want to say to our families, thank you so much for your patience with transportation. We know that there has been a shortage and in the, um, in the board packet, you will see that we are working to make our wages more competitive. Um, we know that uh, with our students who uh, have transportation, um, because of special needs, we know that there is a shortage in drivers. We are working diligently to make certain that our kids are able to get to school safely. And I just really am grateful for the families who are putting uh, your students in our trust and know that we are working diligently to make sure certain that we can get uh, transportation uh, drivers hired. I know that all of the transportation directors around the metro area met today to talk about this very problem because every district is experiencing this. And so just thank you so much um, for your patience and thank you to the board for investing in um, in our transportation and our custodial workers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. Um, with that, we'll adjourn the meeting and um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you.